Aloha means hello to the BCS. Almost certainly it was a little bit hairy, but Hawaii, the only perfect team in the country, will that pay off with the Warriors staying in the top 12? Missouri means goodbye to the national championship game, courtesy of the Sooners, who said later to Chase Daniel and friend. That opened one spot in the title game, and the other was opened stunningly by a mountain meltdown in Morgantown. Welcome to ESPN's Bowl Selection Special, presented by Jack Lynx. Given that West Virginia was a 28-point favorite over Pitt last night, we are told by the mathematical experts, if you get my drift, that equates to a 98% chance that West Virginia would make it to the national title game. But this is the season of 2%, gentlemen, with all the upsets that we've had. Glad to have you with us on our bowl selection special. Alongside Lee Corso, Lou Holtz, Mark May, Kirk Herbstreet, I'm Reese Davis. Brad Edwards is going to join us later on. Joe Shad will be here with the latest news. We'll go commercial free for the first half hour and break down all 32 bowl games, the field of 64, if you will. So, guys, while we're waiting to find out who will officially be in the national championship game, as you look at this right now, look, you can quibble with Ohio State's schedule. You can say they haven't beaten anybody, but here's the deal. Six BCS conferences, only one champion has one loss. That's Ohio State. Right. Got to believe they're getting in. Who should be in the championship? Well, first league? of all, you know, I'm, I like the BCS. I think the system, if you take your time, it'll finally work out himself. But I was worried for a while. Three pretenders, West Virginia, Missouri, and Kansas, were hanging around that title game, and I didn't like that. But now I think if it all fits up the way it is, the Big Ten champion and the SEC champion might get a chance to play. And I like those two teams, Ohio State and LSU. Well, I think the two best teams right now are Southern Cal and Oklahoma. I know Ohio State will get in there, so I think Ohio State and Oklahoma. Why Oklahoma? Well, number one, they beat Missouri. Missouri was ranked number one. They beat them decisively. I think their record's as good as anybody else who's being considered for the championship game. Well, it's got to be Ohio State because they survived, basically. Yeah. They're the only team that survived with one loss in the BCS conference. And kind of like Oklahoma, they won their not only their division, they won their conference, and they beat the number one team in the nation in Missouri. So you have to like those two teams, in my opinion. Yeah, I think there's two different discussions here. I think it's who do you think deserves to be in, and who do you think are the two best teams at the end of the year? If you're going to talk about who are the two best teams at the end of the year, you can bring up Georgia, you can bring up Oklahoma, and you can bring up USC. But in my opinion, if you look at the two teams that deserve to be in the national championship, it's Ohio State coming out of the Big Ten just with one loss, and, and the SEC, LSU survived. I know it was two tough losses, took six overtimes to do it, but they're the champions of the toughest conference in the country. It should be Ohio State and LSU playing for the title. Uh, Mark, what do you do, though, because this, no schedule is ever going to be equal. Sometimes that's a team's fault for not trying to schedule tough non-conference games. Other times it just falls that way. When you start looking and evaluating, say, Ohio State's schedule versus LSU's schedule versus Oklahoma's schedule, how do you handle it? Well, I think you have to look at the strength of the schedule. And you look at Ohio State's schedule, basically they played everybody in the state of Ohio except the better team, Cincinnati, down there that they didn't play that was left over from the Big Ten Conference. But if you look at Oklahoma's schedule, their non-conference schedule, at least they played a Miami, somebody that was supposed to be a pretty good team out of conference. I think you have to measure the non-conference schedule as well as the conference schedule. I, I think the, the only way, because the computers don't affect the BCS standings at the end of the day enough, I think the challenge is on the voters. The voters have to take that into consideration. That's the only way to offset set that and prevent athletic directors and head coaches like my friend LC here from <laughs> stocking up on Southwest Missouri State and, and Alcorn State and anybody else you can find that's a gimme, a gimme win. Hey, that's not, there are no gimme wins, not this year. I know, but, but that's true. But Lee, I don't know how you feel, but you would play Youngstown State, as many of them as you could find. Well, I played LSU. Washington. I know you did. LSU, what? USC, and Nebraska. That's why they got fired. Right. I played those guys off the conference. But let me tell you something also. I think at the end of this thing, it's a public relations thing. The big name school has the advantage. I really do Absolutely. think if the Ohio State's or the LA, Oklahoma, if it's close, those teams are going to get a chance. Somebody's going to pick them because of the name. 
What I really dislike about everybody playing pasties except the Pac-10. When the Pac-10 added another game, they added a conference game. And I applaud them because the Big Ten, the SEC, they went to the bakery and got those cupcakes. But when you have good intersectional rivalry, you can then evaluate the different conferences. When Texas played Ohio State, you had an idea of being able to compare how the other champion did in that. And we can't have that this year. But you look at the Pac-10 and their non-conference schedule, half the teams in the Pac-10, they got a patsy on their schedule. They played Notre Dame, didn't they? Oh, no, I would. I, 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 you let Pitt win on one year. game and this guy becomes unbearable. All I, all year. I mind if I slide over here a little bit. Can we set up Pitt and Notre Dame? That'd be a great well, we, we did hey, that a couple that years ago. That was a great bowl game. He, he the boys here. Hand. Beat the number two team in the nation. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, they did. The five there, hey, you know, it was nice. Pitt. It was Pitt that caused most of this chaos. That was supposed to be unthinkable. All right, there's a refresher for those of you who perhaps have forgotten just how this BCS formula works because it has evolved over the years. Two-thirds of the formula is based on the two polls. The two polls involved are the Harris poll and the coaches poll. The Associated Press no longer involved. It's not just a poll average, it's how many points you get with all the votes. Then the other third of the formula comes from the computer rankings. Six of those, high and low, thrown out, get your average, put together some kind of decimal point, get some logarithms, and then all of a sudden you've got the two teams who will play for the national championship. We are going to have an unprecedented entrant into the national title game this year. For the first time, we will have a two-loss team, almost certainly. Our BCS guru, Brad Edwards, is here now. All right, Brad, lot, lots of contenders for that other spot, assuming Ohio State's going to get one. Who? Why? I don't think there's any question it's going to be LSU. Now, the, the, you mentioned that one-third of that formula is the coaches poll, which came out earlier today. Ohio State, number one. LSU, a very comfortable number two ahead of Oklahoma. Uh, I happen to know from my knowledge of the computers that LSU will also be ranked ahead of Oklahoma in that element of the formula, which means unless the Harris Poll delivers the biggest upset of this college football season, uh, it's easily going to be Ohio State and LSU for the national title. And the two teams that lost to a, a, an underdog, uh, an unranked team on their home field in the second to last game, uh, are going to back their way into this thing. And keep this in mind. Notre Dame has a longer winning streak than either of the teams that will be playing for the national. Oh, oh well, how about uh, that? Another shot. Be Lou, Lou loved that. Good one. going, Brad. Good <laughs> research, buddy. Hey, what happened to the whole thing, Brad? That you can't lose late in the season. Well, you know that that was obviously a big deal during the uh, the previous format. I guess prior to the BCS. Uh, the computers kind of uh, alleviated that some in the early BCS years because they had enough of a percentage of the formula uh, that you know they're looking at who you lost to, not so much when you lost. But I think uh, I think it's been clear now that the polls have reestablished of two thirds of the formula, uh, and they're really determining how things shape up. Uh, that that losing late uh, is going to hurt you, and of course. Ohio State and LSU were right there in the driver's seat at 1-2 just a few weeks ago. They both lost and fell back, and it took all the other teams in front of them losing again to get them back up there. So, yeah, with the formula being what it is now, uh, there's no question that losing late uh, certainly hurts you. All right. Now, Brad, you've looked at this probably more than just about anybody else out there. They've tweaked the formula again and again. It's always very reactive. If something goes wrong, public perception is not what it should be for the title matchup. They tweak it. What's your gut feeling about how this is going to be handled after this? Is the formula where they want it? Do you expect more changes? I don't think there's anything they can do, Reese. I mean, the, the, this is a, a season in which you've got uh, a bunch of teams that, that all have flaws. I mean, they, ha they all have two losses. And in reality, this is what the BCS was set up to do. There's a, a season when you have a bunch of teams that all have similar records and similar resumes, and, and the formula was put together in order to take – two teams out of that bunch and say these are the best two. Now, you can debate all day whether it got the right two, uh, but the point of the BCS is to take two out of that group and say these are the two that are going to play. Uh, and they did that. And the truth of the matter is, I don't think anybody can say they got a raw deal in this case because every two-loss team out there has a play they could have made somewhere along the way uh, that would give them only one loss on the season, and they would be the team that would be playing in that championship game. And so uh, I don't think this is nearly as controversial as some of the things we've had in recent seasons. Okay, Brad, when you have two undefeated teams at the end of the season in those years, the BCS does not work. 
because it doesn't have to, correct? That's right. Yeah, the BCS <laughs> doesn't do anything when there are two undefeated teams and only two. All right, Brad Edwards, our BCS guru, always a pleasure. We'll see how close Bradley is once we find out who's playing in that national championship game in New Orleans. Brad Edwards, always reporting. All right, guys, uh, the one thing that we didn't expect yesterday, and we probably should have given what's happened this season, was Pittsburgh going into Morgantown 4-7 and seven, and finding a way to beat off the men in mustard or beat, beat them out of a championship game appearance. Pat White goes down and dislocated a thumb. Third quarter, Pittsburgh was down 7-3. to three. Pat Bostic, the freshman, keeping it 10-7. The fourth quarter, Pat White came back into the game. He was in street clothes for a while. He dressed. He's working on the pitch. Fourth and three. This is supposed to be money time for Steve Slayton, Mayday. Couldn't get it done. They should have given the ball to Owen Schmidt, the big fullback taking up the middle, but the Panther defense held strong. Uh, Slayton had 11 yards on nine carries. And then White on a fourth and 17 play looking for West Lions. And 13-9, Juan Stett. Paul Rhodes, defensive coordinator, did a tremendous job against the number two team in the country. And you could just sense, as that game went along, Lou, you, you've been in this situation before, often you're on the winning side. But when a heavily favored team, a couple of miscues, West Virginia missed a couple of field goals, started getting tighter and tighter and more anxious and more anxious, and Pittsburgh gained confidence. Well, not only did the players get tighter, the coaches get tighter. And then what happened? The fans get tight. When they showed the fans in the stands, they were scared to death from the middle of the second quarter on. Things just weren't going that way. But I will say this. West Virginia got every opportunity to win that game. They got some great calls, which should have enabled Pitt to put the game away. There's one thing also about it. It's like playing high-stakes poker. The higher the stakes, the more you have a tendency to do that. And that's what happened to West Virginia. They just slowly, slowly got in a position where they were not playing West Virginia football because I think the pressure got to them. I think it's, it's something for all fans to remember. You know, when you, when you, this year is one of those years where you kind of expect the unexpected. But in the last two or three weeks, when people assume that this team appears to be unbeatable, they're in the driver's seat, we all did that. We thought, maybe not you, but a lot of us thought West Virginia, it's going to be no problem. They're going to get by Pitt and they're going to be in. It's a done deal. What's going to happen to Missouri was really the only question. It's another example of what the BCS can do to a team that's unfamiliar with that pressure. Lee just talked about the Oklahomas, the Ohio States, the USC's, the LSU's, the Florida's. They're used to being in there, so they handle it a lot better later in the year. West Virginia and their fans and their players and coaches, they played not to lose instead of turning it loose. And West Virginia, Missouri, Kansas. And Kansas. Yeah. All three of them had a shot but couldn't handle the pressure. But, right. but let's give Pitt a little bit of credit. They had a great defense going sure into did. this football game, and when you look how well Pitt played, some of the other schools in the conference, you've got an idea. This team could be dangerous. I know that Pitt played well in the game, and they won the football game, and congratulations to Dave Wanstad and that team and their staff, but the bottom line is when you lose Pat White, a player that's rushed for 440 yards the last two games against Pittsburgh, that's devastating to your offense. I got a great point. Where's Steve Slayton? Wait, well, I, got, I, got, I, I got a great yeah. question on follow-up. Oregon lost Dixon, Oklahoma lost Bradford, West Virginia lost White. Mm -hmm. All three of them lost major games that mm -hmm. cost them a shot at the national title. The quarterback, LSU lost Flynn, and, and Paralu got it done. And Southern That's it. Cal That's why lost, they deserve to get in That's there, right. How about that? And Southern Cal lost John David Booty against Oregon, I yeah. think it was. Oh, yeah, and he was hurt against here, Stanford, here. although he yeah. continued to play. Yeah. Sanchez played the game. Hey, all right, all right. You're all saying it's the quarterback. It's not the quarterback. It's the offensive Oh, line. it's not. <laughs> but anybody in the backfield, if the line blocks, the quarterback yeah. will get it done. Right. That's why they called him the seven mules. You can put anybody up there that doesn't have to think. <laughs> so West Virginia opened up that spot in the title game, and that is the kind of loss that's going to stick with the mm -hmm. Program for a little while too. I'm not saying they're coming off the tracks or anything like that, but th that one's going to be tough to get over. Even though they still, uh, they're still going to go to a BCS game because they'd already clinched that prior to the uh, Pittsburgh have you, game. Have you guys ever seen a coach? And we all love Rich, but he was devastated. He was. Did you yeah. see him in a post-game uh, press conference. Hey, hey I've been there. Uh, 1993. Uh, you're one play away from oh. the national championship, and the guy kicks the longest field. It devastates you. You work so hard. I mean, it's a not. So close. It's not an eight to five job. You start soon as the last game ended the preseason. And it, and you're lifting weights, you're running, you're practicing, you're meeting. You pay a tremendous price, Lee. You know what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, all that work and that, and it just comes down 
in one play. Mm. But the key is for this football team, because they're a fairly young football team, especially their stars are underclassmen, Steve Slayton and Pat White, how they respond now, because they're going to a BCS game, how they respond in the next month, how Rich Rodriguez responds with this football team to get them prepared to play in this big game, and that's going to be a jumping stick, to, a jumping point for next year to see how well they play, because you've got the offseason, the lifting weights, sure. getting ready, spring ball. If they're all down going into that, they're not going to come out and play well next season. You know what an overlooked footnote is to that West Virginia loss last night? Randy Edsel said his players started calling him from UConn saying, does this mean we get rings too? <laughs> and it does. UConn, co-champions of the Big East for Randy Edsel. Oh. I mean, although they lost the head-to-head -head battle decisively in Morgantown the previous week. While we're waiting on all of the BCS games to be announced and unveiled, we will tell you some of the other games during the course of our bowl selection special. 32 bowl games this year. A field of 64, if you will. And let's check in now with one of the BCS games that has just been announced. The Rose Bowl game presented by City. Tuesday, January 1st, New Year's Day, 4.30 wow. in the afternoon. And the traditional Pac-10, Big Ten matchup. Guys, Ron Zook taking Illinois to the Rose Bowl. Let's just take a moment to take that in. Soak it in for a minute. That is remarkable. And, and there's two things here I like to say. Number one, what you just said, Ron Zook getting this team, the Fighting Illini, into Pasadena and a chance to play and represent the Big Ten, the Rose Bowl. Remarkable effort for him, his entire staff, Juice Williams and these players. Beating Ohio State obviously got him to this point. But now let's go back to the decision. The Rose Bowl. Had an opportunity, I'm sure, and we'll see how this plays out, to make a selection. I'm going to be interested to see how the other BCS bowl games play out and who else was available. We all thought it was a decision between Georgia and Illinois. Would the, would the, uh, the Rose Bowl go with tradition, the parade, the Big Ten and the Pac-10, or would they go with the great matchup between the two hottest teams, uh -huh. Georgia and USC, they went with tradition. Yeah, they went with tradition, and you're going to call that game. That should be yeah. a great matchup because yeah. USC's defense has been phenomenal the entire season. To see those young players, when you look at a Juice Williams and a Rashard Mendenhall going against this USC defense, it's going to be interesting to see how they play in this. But I think this is a great matchup. You look at the Rose Bowl, the granddaddy of them all, they stayed with tradition. Okay, let's. Uh, we're going to get back to the Rose Bowl and talk about it in just a minute, but some of the other BCS games, the BCS picture becoming a little bit more clear now. And the next game that has been announced and is now set, the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl to be played on the 2nd of January, 8 o'clock. Hey and now. that is where the hey Big now. East now co-champion, West Virginia, will go to take on the Big 12 champion, Oklahoma Sooners. So now you know for sure that Oklahoma didn't make up enough ground in the BCS standings in order to get to the national championship game. West Virginia and Oklahoma. And I think the big question, Lee, is going to be, and I think you've hit on this a couple of times, what kind of attitude and emotion will West Virginia arrive in the desert with? They can have the world's greatest attitude in America. They're not going to beat Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma's one of the best football teams in the nation. When they got that Bradford at quarterback, I saw them demolish the number one team in the nation with my own eyes. That Bradford, that defense, those athletes, they get <laughs> off the bus. And I promise you, Kirk, you saw they get off the bus. That's the finest looking football team on a hoof <laughs> that you can see. And now when they got Bradford throwing the football and they're playing defense, West Virginia is going to have a lousy offseason, Mark. Did you get that on the you. hoof? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know one, one, one thing I've seen in the last two weeks, when DeMarco Murray went down with an injury, I think it lit a fire underneath Alan Patrick. I think Alan Patrick right now is healthy. He's running, I think, very physical. They're dominating the line of scrimmage. And, and Lee's right. This team looks the part. The one thing, and the mindset of, of Oklahoma, if you get them upset, if I'm Rich Rodriguez, I don't have a press conference because Oklahoma finds a way to get mad. Oh, about yeah, they, they did it to Missouri. I mean, I mean, you start mentioning those fumbles, Anything. and I mean, they went crazy. Well, you thought Oklahoma should have been in the championship game. I thought game, they though. should have been in the championship game, but if they aren't, I've been in sitting in this seat this entire year, and I believe anything can happen when you say West Virginia can't win. I said the same thing about Appalachian State against Michigan and Stanford. No chance against Southern guy. It's crazy. But let's remember this. Two years ago, that same West Virginia talent with White and Slayton, et cetera, beat Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. I agree with you. Oklahoma should have been the championship game, I think. But West Virginia will surprise you. They'll, they'll come back. You All right. got time. Uh, we'll continue talking about that one as well. <laughs> Get back to the Rose Bowl in a moment. But there is another BCS game. That what do we got? Set. What do we got? FedEx Orange Bowl. Hey. What do we have? Woo! Ah, Chaw, Jay, Hawk. What about that? 
up? Hey, you. What about Missouri? Huh? They're not going. Missouri, uh, wait a minute. Can I get a point here? Yeah. yeah. Did, did Missouri beat Kansas? Kansas? Kansas. Kansas. Yeah. Did they beat Illinois? Yeah. Where are they going? I don't want to say anything. I got to. Did they beat Kansas? But they're they not going Illinois. to BCS. Yeah. But they're not, not going to the Orange Bowl. <laughs> they're number one in the, the country nation. going they into lose. the last week. And they beat two teams going to BCS. I say something's that. wrong with the system. Uh, you think Missouri should have been in there oh, ahead of Kansas? Well, well I think he obviously it, does. Well, they beat them. You can justify why every team's in every vote. Well, you cannot do justify why other teams are not. You can't justify why Missouri's not there, but you don't have to. All you have to do is justify why Kansas there. Rule number one: if you're number one, win. That's all. I uh, they were number one they lost. Oh. Hey, Kansas is going to the FedEx Orange Bowl for the first time since oh. 1968. The last time they went, Bobby Douglas played quarterback. John Riggins was yeah, in the backfield for the Jayhawks. They played Penn State. They were ahead 14-7 in the waning moments. Kansas made a mistake on defense. They sent 12 guys onto the field. The officials didn't see it. Oh. Five plays. Penn State finally scored a touchdown against them. They went for two, didn't get it. Then they found the 12th guy on the field. Penalty, two-point conversion, they lost. And I think I think one of my favorite people in here is maybe Pepper Rogers. He was yep. coach. He was coach. coach. Yep. Yeah. Right. That ball game, Our, my favorite. In fact, Pepper blew, uh, blamed the game yeah. on the officials. Said they'd blew. counted the 12 the first time. They'd been penalized when they should have been, and they would have won the game. We were at Ohio State. We'd just beaten Southern Cal in the Rose Bowl. Going to win the national championship. The only other undefeated team was Penn State. I'm sitting there in the room watching it. 14-7, they score. They go for two. They don't make it. I leave. I go to the party. Hey. And I find out all of a sudden they called the penalty, got a second chance, Penn State Pepper wins 15 14. Pepper Rogers. And then he blamed it on the officials. <laughs> he said, if it had cut the 12 guys before, then they would have had the two oh, point conversion. What are you guys trying to bring me in this for? In 1968, I was like yeah. eight years old. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> born yet. Oh, no. no. Hey. Hey, let's oh, bring it back. I tell you. Let's bring it back to 2007. Hey. Yeah, let's, do it. Let's, let's get yeah. back to it. Let's get let's back to the Kansas, Missouri. Missouri. Let, let, me, let me just yeah, make please. sure people understand as, as many people who are frustrated by the system. Understand that when it comes to the bowls, the Orange Bowl has a chance to make a selection, an at-large pick. Once they have Virginia Tech, they're not locked into Kansas. They could select Kansas. They could select Missouri. There are a number of teams that they could select. I think the Orange Bowl committee should be asked the question, why Kansas over Missouri. Missouri, Lee just talked about, beat Kansas. They were in the Big 12 championship. They're 11-1 and in their last game, and they lost by what every, a lot of people up here are saying, the best, best team, team in the country. country. They, they were 14-14 at half. It yeah. wasn't like they just didn't show up to play. There are a couple of things to remember, though, in, in fairness to the Bulls. Number one, the BCS is, is designed Chickens. to do one thing. One versus two. That's all it's designed it. to do. After that, tickets, and for some reason, sometimes it's not fair, and I'm not really sure that it is in this situation because Kansas lost its last game, too. But sometimes it seems bowls are hesitant to take the team that lost in a conference championship game and is coming off a great disappointment. But Missouri misses Missouri. an opportunity to play in the national title game, and sometimes they seem reluctant to take them. Don't you think Missouri is a team that is kind of an X factor here, where they just they haven't had any experience of this? I think they would draw. They still. Oh, I think they would too. I'm just saying. I'm just saying what the line of thinking yeah. has been. I'm not saying that that was the All line right. of thinking here. Well, here it is, ladies and gentlemen, on January 7th, the Louisiana Superdome. It will be a virtual home game for the LSU Tigers, who will take on Ohio State. And for all of the Buckeyes' storied tradition, the one thing they have never done is beaten an SEC team in a bowl game. 0-0, 0-8, 41-14 to Florida last year, and now they are going into the Tigers' den, literally. Uh, you, you guys have seen this happen time and time again. You go in. To that building, play an SEC team, particularly this SEC team, coached by the artist formerly known as a Michigan man, Les Miles, against Ohio State, and there is intrigue aplenty, Mark. There definitely is, and Les Miles is going to get his chance against Ohio State, and you look at this match, I think it's a speed against LSU. It's going to be interesting to see how Ohio State matches up against that, because the last time we saw them on the big stage in a national championship game against Florida, not so much. They couldn't get it done against Florida speed, so it's going to be interesting to see how they match up against the power strength and speed of an LSU. You guys know we do 152 different shows between now and this game. <laughs> And I think Ohio State will hear nothing but 41 to 14 in the SEC speed and 0 and 8 in the bowl games going into the Superdome to play LSU basically at a home game. Ohio State doesn't have a chance. Ohio State's too slow. Oh, the Big up. Ten. I, I'm just saying no, that that's know, what they're going to hear. I'm kidding. I'm telling you, you right now. Talk. Listen, <laughs> no, just listen real quick. Ohio State is getting exactly what they needed 
a shot at redemption. This does not work out any better for Ohio State than to have this exact game in this building. If they have a chance, the table has been set. Now we see what they do with it. All right, now, Lee, you, you yeah. say, you say you, you've seen all of these teams. Yes, sir. I've seen both those. Ohio State continually puts t players into the NFL, players who seem to run just fine. Why is it that there is this a big myth that Ohio State doesn't have the speed to run with teams? Uh, let me tell you something. Ohio State doesn't need the speed. All they need to do is get those five guys up in the front. They got the best offensive line in the nation. They will knock that LSU front seven right off the ball. They're mean, they're fast, they're tough, and they're well coached. That can control the game. And this guy, Beanie Wells, is a man. LSU has not played. I know. McFarland can run. But this guy here is a man. And he gets behind those other monsters, and it looks like broom. they will come down. They will ball control them, knock them, and test the LSU manner. I like this Ohio State team. I tell you what. And then, Lou, they'll fake that guy, and they'll go over the top. I'm telling you, I think they got a really chance of beating these guys. I think it's the best matchup Ohio State can have. I don't think that LSU will beat Ohio State for several reasons. Ohio State's defense is outstanding. They have trouble with one thing. When you spread them all out and you get a hot quarterback that can run, whether it be Juice Williams or whether it happened to be Tebow, et cetera, in the bowl game last year. In addition to that, LSU losing their great defensive coordinator. He's going to Nebraska. Now, when you take the fact that they gave up over 1,000 yards or close to 1,000 yards in their last two games before the championship, I just don't think LSU is going to match up very well against Ohio State. And Ohio State's defense outstanding. Against Michigan, they gave up, what, 178 yards? You put a conventional offense up there, Ohio State will smash it. I love LSU in this game. They're going to have a month oh, to get prepared. They're playing at home better. in the Sugar Bowl. <laughs> Glenn Dorsey's going to be healthy for this game. His last chance in a national championship game in their own backyard. Are you kidding me? Trendon Holiday, one of the fastest men in America out there running around. And you talked about this offense being stagnant or standing in front of them. How about Ryan Perillo? He can run. You know, Matt Flynn runs about a 4 5 40. He can run the spread offense. All I can tell you is we still have about how many days, Reese? Break that down. Uh, it's going to be about 35, I think. 35. Would that be right today? I, is it enough for Glenn? It's enough for Glenn Dorsey to get help. Mm -hmm. It's enough for this LSU defense, and Lou is right. I mean, Bo Pelini's decision to stay, and I talked to him yesterday, he would like to stay and try to coach and be a part of this national championship effort for LSU. But if he stays or if he goes to Nebraska, that's an issue that LSU is going to have to deal with. But the health of this defense has been a, a major concern down the stretch. This rest will give them time to go. And I'm sorry, I've been to, I've been to New Orleans and seen LSU play in a national championship game in 2003. It's scary. They played Oklahoma, and they took the entire stadium over. It was a home game. So Ohio State's basically going to Baton Rouge to try to beat LSU. And it's, I, I'm looking forward to my man here for 35 days saying Ohio State doesn't have a chance. Yeah. And my man over here saying Ohio State does have a chance. You guys make your predictions. I don't think LSU here. has much of a chance. Yeah, I know. I like I Ohio, and I tell you what, don't underestimate the Ohio State Buckeye fans. There'll be 45,000 of them that don't go to the game. Right. They'll just go around the stadium and party <laughs> while the they're Buckeyes are inside. <laughs> they're good in that, that category. They're, they're very good. good. They're better than anybody in the country. Better than partying than anybody. Following their team and partying, not going to the game. All right, let's get back to this, though. It's going to be a great matchup, we all think. I think we can all agree on that. But the question is, with the BCS, Lou, do you think that the BCS got it right and got the two most deserving teams into the title game? No, I think if you wanted the best football game, I think it should have been Oklahoma against Ohio State. I really do. If you wanted the two best teams playing right now, I like USC and I like Oklahoma. Hey, you, LSU had a wonderful year, and they are very, very talented. But losing the defense coordinator and everything else, I say, hey, Oklahoma deserved it. They beat the number one team in the country decisively, beat them twice. And uh, they lost without Bradford, and he'll be back. Well, there's one thing also, and I, I'm my devil's advocate, but just a point. There are some people out there that say that Ohio State played a soft schedule. Mm -hmm. They did. And, and, and maybe, maybe they don't deserve, even though they only have one loss, maybe they don't have deserve to be over those two lost teams who played a lot tougher football mm -hmm. teams throughout the year. There's a... There's some people Are out you there. you saying that? I, yeah, I'm saying that. So you're they, saying they shouldn't be there? No, I say they should be there only because the other guys didn't perform. 
But there's a lot of people out there who say when you play Akron, Cincinnati, no, Akron, Kent, and Youngstown. Now be careful, that's my alma. I know, but you play, <laughs> you're the state champion of Ohio. There's a lot of people nationally to say. I'm getting them in my high school game next okay. time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, don't get them against real good teams, though. But you know, there's a lot of people out there to say that Ohio State Buckeyes played a soft schedule, and that's why they worked themselves in there while everybody else lost big games. Plus, at the, the Big Ten's down. I mean, not only did they play that, I, an I average think that's pretty apparent. Uh, yeah. The Big Ten is down. Well, it is. But I'm saying they played an, a terrible non-conference schedule, and then the Big Ten's down. Right. So, I mean, who, who could you say that they beat at this point to make you feel good? But that, that it, in my opinion, that's behind you. Now it's about Reese's question, did the system work and put the two best teams in based on the way the system works out? I thought Ohio State and LSU, we talked about this light last night, should be the two teams in the championship game. It's a, it, a whole different debate about who the hottest teams are, who the best teams are, that's a different discussion than who are the two teams that should be in this championship game. It should be Ohio State and LSU. I want to clarify a couple of things that have come up. One, about the defensive coordinator for LSU, Bo Pelini. He has taken over as the head coach at Nebraska, but as Kirk mentioned when he last spoke to him, still up in the air a little bit about whether he's going to guide the defense. Now, for Nebraska, he has to get on the road recruiting, but there is a dead period coming up when uh, it wouldn't affect the recruiting at all and perhaps could even enhance it by him being so visible as defensive coordinator if that's what happens. Hey, let me, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm the University of Nebraska. I hire a football coach. Get your butt here in Lincoln and be my coach. Don't go to Baton Rouge and coach him one minute. Well, Lou, I has, wouldn't let him here. I would. I tell you what, I wouldn't let him around my football program one minute if I. That's great stuff, and I, I love to hear what you were talking about earlier. But before that, I just want to say, in 2003, very similar situation, when Oklahoma had to go and play in the national title in the same venue, and they went out and played against LSU. Mike Stoops was a defensive coordinator on that defense that year, and got offered the Arizona job. Mike Stoops had to make the exact same decision. Do I stay and try to win the championship with my brother and my team, or do I go and get the staff together and start to recruit? He decided to go, put the staff together and go out and recruit. He's standing on the side. In fact, he works with us on game day that night. He's standing on the side set and breaking down the two teams. About third quarter, he, you know, Mike Stoops is. I mean, he's down there. He's trying not to coach, trying not to coach. <laughs> third quarter, give me those headsets. He's down there. He's got the headsets. So, so he went into the game not wanting to be the def defense coordinator, and then he ended up trying to get I the ball. I got to say, this is my last thing, and I'm going to last thing. I'm a Florida State Seminole graduate. Mark Rick. Mark Rick. Mark Rick. Wait a minute. Mark Rick, the world's greatest offensive coach. Gets the Georgia job. And the Florida State staff says, oh, Mark, don't worry about it. We know you're going to be the Georgia coach the next week or two. But come and help our offense beat Oklahoma. They didn't score a touchdown. Not even one touchdown with Mark Rick, what? who cannot serve two masters. I'm telling you. Lou, what would you do, what do you if, think? You were, if you were, if you were Les Miles? If you're Les Miles, what do you do? I've been in that situation. We really appreciate everything you've done. I Thanks. wish you well. And I want to tell you why. Because if he stayed, he's worried about Nebraska. Thank you. He said, he's trying to recruit. He's trying to put the staff. Then you have the other coaches there. Well, am I going to go as his defense corner? Oh, that guy's going. And recruiting goes there. And then the worst thing that happens is they get in the game and they don't have to live with the result. You lose a game 45 nothing. And you lose been nice. You're out. You're gone. You don't hear about the game. Wait, wait. You have to. I, 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 I did what I feel. I, because I've been a boat. <laughs> sides of it, and he should not cook. I'm sitting on a side. <laughs> Other than that, I don't feel oh, All right, guys. Let me well, give me a whistle. I'm ready to go. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I'll be your defense coordinator. Wait a minute. Let's have a look at our sports And I'm, sit, I'm sitting on a side. <laughs> the question we asked. Mark Nichols have a cold drink, and they don't say hey, what's going I'm going to jerk some knobs and change right now. Let's go. 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 let us go the best team in college football. Look at the two states, by the yeah. way. Okay, well, I mean, Louisiana, that, that boot down there, they think LSU is certainly the great state of Ohio thinks so as well. This is the entire lineup for the BCS games. The one game we have not talked about, Hawaii making it into a BCS game. They will take on Georgia and at large out of the SEC. That will happen in New Orleans as well prior to the BCS title game between LSU and Ohio State on January 7th. And we are pleased now to be joined by the head coach of one of the teams that will play for the national championship for the second straight year. Jim Tressel has his Ohio State Buckeyes in the title game. Uh, Jim, what did you think your chances were of playing for the national title even after you guys beat Michigan? 
You know, it was hard to think with all this noise in my ear here the last uh, minute or so, yeah, hearing all these you. guys screaming at each other and guys spreading rumors and doing all that stuff. It's been hard to think as a coach recently. But, uh, you know, quite honestly, you know, we felt after uh, the end of the regular season that, you know, it. Who knew how good a chance we would have to play in the title game? We talk always at the beginning of the year, you better win all your games if you want to go to the BCS title game. So, uh, you know, we didn't know for sure. As we saw things unfold, and you see all these good football teams banging into each other, uh, we had good fortune, and here we get a chance to play in the title game. So what was it like watching those two games last night and waiting on the results? Well, you know, it's just a reminder. You don't get to watch that much football when you're a coach, believe it or not. Uh, you're so busy. But we've had the last couple weekends where we can watch teams play. And the thing that uh, came into my mind is there's an awful lot of good football teams in this country. And uh, you better be at the top of your game every time you play, most especially uh, in a conference championship game or a rival game or whatever it happens to be. And, you know, nothing surprised me. It wouldn't have surprised me if... The ebb and flow changed nine different times in those games, and it was fun watching our players watch them because they certainly wanted a chance to play in the title game, and, and it was just great entertainment. Uh, was it spirited when they were watching the West Virginia-Pittsburgh game, would you say? Oh, it really was. In fact, they had in our team meeting room uh, both of the games going on at once. And it was interesting sitting behind them listening. It was like a coaching clinic. You know, they're coaching up the guys, and each of those players need to do this and do that and hooping it up when things happened. And, you know, it was just it was great to be a part of this uh, BCS whole situation. How much emphasis, Jim, do you sense among the players toward gaining some redemption for what happened in the national championship game last year? You know, we haven't spent a whole bunch of time with that at all. Uh, we came in uh, this year having lost 18 fifth-year seniors and three juniors to the NFL, and we were just going to work on trying to figure out who we were and, and trying to figure out if we could become a good team. Certainly that was in the back of our mind that we hadn't played as well as we could have in the last game that we played, but we had so much work to do with the new outfit that uh, our focus was on that. But didn't you find a way to keep them reminded of the score last year, like perhaps every time they entered a building around the football area? Well, you always have to have reminders of things. And that reminder was? Work. And what was that reminder? Well, we had a lot of different reminders. In fact, they changed about every week. So <laughs> how long is your program? Well, I was just wondering. <laughs> I, I had heard that perhaps one of the codes to enter certain areas was the score from the championship game last year. Now, is that what your sources said? <laughs> well, we have some sources in that area. You have some good sources? Well, you know what? There was about a two-week time uh, in January where that's true. But after that, that's not the case. Okay. What do you think it will be like playing LSU in its home state, what some would refer to as a virtual home game for the Tigers? Well, LSU is a good football team. I don't think anyone would question that. I was particularly impressed with the fact that, you know, they go through that tough SEC schedule, and I don't think anyone can question uh, what rugged road they had to go through. I had that heartbreaking loss against Arkansas, uh, regrouped, were banged up a little bit, uh, came back in the SEC title game amidst lots of things being talked about in terms of their coaching staff and their future and all those things, and they had the wherewithal. They had the focus, they had the leadership inside the locker room, which is what's most important, to come up and win the SEC. Uh, so we know that it's going to be a battle against a very mature group. Uh, whether it's a home game or whatever, I don't know that that's a big issue. But uh, the fact that we're playing a very, very good, tough, fast, powerful, uh, skilled, excellent SEC football team, uh, you know, we've got our work cut out. Jim, I want to take you back to the, to the days after the Illinois game. It probably helped to have Michigan on the horizon. But what did you learn about your team with the way they responded after that disappointing loss? Well, I, I think any time you lose, uh, the response to, you know, why did that occur is important. And it wasn't uh, finger pointing. It wasn't, well, the officials didn't do this or the ball didn't bounce our way or anything. It was simply, you know, what can I do so that our team can be better in the future. And our future was coming fast because we were heading to Ann Arbor. We were going to play against a tough football team, a team that had been through a lot of adversity. Now, everyone seemed to think they were playing their last game uh, for Coach Carr, who's been, you know, a legend in our game. And so we knew that it was going to be a battle. And I thought our guys regrouped, looked in the mirror, went to work, 
uh, went to Ann Arbor, you know, wanting to play as good as we could and, and played a, a good, tough football game. Jim, congratulations. Another fabulous season with the Buckeyes, and we look forward to seeing you in the national championship game. Okay, thanks so much. We're, we're proud to be coming down to New Orleans. As well you should be. Jim Tressel, head coach of the Buckeyes. Excellent run he's had in Columbus. Georgia hoped it would be in the title game. We'll talk dogs in a bit. The All-State BCS National Championship game is set, and it will be LSU and Ohio State. What this matchup does guarantee is that we will have our first multiple BCS champion in the BCS era. Remember the year that LSU went, I mean, pardon me, when USC went back to back, they had to share one of the championships with LSU. It was the Tigers who won the BCS championship in 2003. So either the Buckeyes or the Tigers will be the first multiple champions in the BCS era. Uh, Jim Tressel obviously uh, was confident, calm, reserved. You know him very well. What is it about him that enables him to suffer great losses? They lost Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, a bevy of receivers, and here they are back in the national well, I, I think people nationally underestimate the talent pool that Ohio State has. They're second only to USC as far as players in the NFL. So this stereotype on Ohio State, that because you watched them play Florida, and you thought they can't run with Florida. Same reason USC didn't play well against Stanford. Same reason Pitt didn't play well last night against West Virginia. If you don't show up ready to play psychologically, you don't put a great game out on the football field and you get embarrassed. It happened to Ohio State that they were on such a grand stage that everybody walked away from that game saying, ah, oh, they're from the Big Ten. They're a slow team. I think people will be surprised by the depth of his athletic ability on this football team. If you put Ohio State and LSU and didn't put the name at the top and you put their 40 times on a sheet of paper, I think people will be surprised to see the speed and how even it actually is between the two teams. I think uh, LSU would be a little bit faster trend in Holiday. Well, Holiday yeah. Yeah. Fastest man yeah. in the country. Oh, yeah. oh, by the way, th when you made that comment about Pitt, Pitt did show up because they beat West Virginia. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm saying Pitt did. West Virginia didn't show up. Not right, so much. Right. But if you look at these two teams, I think it's a great matchup because Lee mentioned it, that the big offensive line mm -hmm. that Ohio State possesses, mm -hmm. they should be able to control the clock, play trestle ball. It's going to be interesting to see how Les Miles plays against that offensive line. That come after him, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Okay, Les Miles and LSU, uh, they are going to the national championship game. We just heard from Jim Trestle a couple of moments ago. And joining us now is the head coach of the LSU Tigers, Les Miles. And Les, your team making it into the national championship game. And what was it like watching those games last night and hoping that you get an opportunity? Well, we were on a plane, and the, uh, what, what was happening is our uh, pilot was uh, giving us the updates. And uh, by the time that uh, uh, we had gotten home, it was we understood that uh, both one and two had lost. And so we were very hopeful and uh, really were, you know, waiting for the vote to come out. Well, once they found out while everybody was still in the air, everything was safe on the airline, I assume. It was not raucous on there, was it? No, I think there was some excitement being had but as, the, as, as the scores were being uh, uh, relayed. Uh, uh, I think the noise level inside the plane was much greater than that outside the plane. After you guys lost to Arkansas, Les, what did you think your chances were of playing for the national championship? Well, honestly, we, we held out hope. We, we felt like the, uh, the opportunity to play well in the championship game and if something would occur, uh, you know, a team that, uh, you know, had played as many nationally ranked teams as we have and won. Uh, the fact that we were undefeated in, uh, in regulation, and I know that it's, it's two losses in triple overtime, but also it's undefeated in regulation, that, they're, uh, that the, body of the body of work that this team, you know, has accomplished might well qualify us for the game. What impact do you think it's going to have to play in your home state and largely in front of your home crowd? Well, it's a, uh, we're, we're going to enjoy it fully. It's a, a great opportunity for us. Uh, we, uh, we, ins we certainly enjoy playing in that dome. We've, we played in it this year earlier. Uh, we played in the Sugar Bowl a year ago. So, uh, you know, we're very comfortable in those surroundings. There is some irony in that you're facing Ohio State. What will playing against the Buckeyes mean to you personally? Um, just that they're a very quality team. I, uh, I, I recognize that, uh, you know, they have great talent, well coached, um, you know, big offensive line, you know, talented running back, and a uh, very, very gifted uh, receiver. Good defense. Defense has always been a, a trademark of that school for time. So we, uh, we look forward to the competition. Very good football team. 
be a great matchup. It's been an emotional, dramatic few days for you, Les. What were your expectations when LSU granted Michigan permission to talk to you about their head coaching job? Well, I really had uh, um, no expectations. I was really focused on the job at hand and uh, you know, preparing this team for a, for a championship in the conference. What led you to decide not to speak to Michigan about that job at all? Well, the, uh, the uh, significance of the game, the, the championship game, and preparing a team uh, to play in that game, uh, the fact that uh, the coach could be a distraction, the fact that uh, uh, misinformation could uh, question the coach's authority, um, you know, concerned me most. And, and you know, as a coach, I, uh, I didn't want to stand in, in the way in any way of our team's performance, so I, I needed to get it out of the way uh, quickly. Uh, I did, and, uh, and we went on. How would you describe the contact that is said to have been made between intermediaries for both you and for Michigan? Um, there's, there's two people that, uh, that, that uh, communicate for me, myself and George Bass. And uh, then neither of us had any uh, direct contact uh, with Michigan. So after you have slept on your decision and have decided to stay at LSU, what were your thoughts about your decision this morning after making the decision yesterday? Well, I, uh, I, I've been thinking about nothing but about this uh, title game this, uh, and preparing this team uh, to play in a, a, uh, a great opportunity, uh, one that this team deserves. And I'll do everything in my power to prepare it well and look forward to playing January 7th. Uh, Les, I asked Jim Trestle this same question. You guys in very similar circumstances in that you lost your next to the last game of the season. What was it about your players that allowed them to stay positive and come back and, and put together an effort that ended up getting them in the national championship game? Uh, we have great senior leadership. We have great team leadership. The chemistry on this football team is strong. Um, uh, maybe the greatest characteristic of this football team is competitive. And, uh, you know, once you finish second, you, uh, you, you look forward to uh, the next time you take the field. And this football team has done that every time. Uh, there was no question that we were going to play well in the championship game. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that this team has always done. It responds uh, to adversity. All right, Les, you said at the end of your press conference yesterday that you were at home. What does being at home mean to you? Um, my family, uh, myself, and uh, my, uh, it, it's where I'm going to stay and stay for a long time. Well, Les, congratulations on making it into the national championship game and on the SEC championship, and we look forward to seeing you in New Orleans. Thank you very much. Now, Les Miles, a head coach at LSU, has the SEC title, has a chance to win the national title. The Bayou Bengals become the first two-loss team to play in the BCS championship game, and as mentioned, Ohio State 0-8 against the SEC in bowl games. And, uh, you know, in this season of unexpected occurrences, there is pretty delicious irony in that this uh, self-proclaimed Michigan man who is thought to be the next head coach at Michigan is going to have to go through Ohio State if he wants to win the national championship. I think that's overplayed. I mean, you know, he, it was a thousand years ago when he was a Michigan man. He's an LSU guy right now, and his biggest problem, instead of talking about Michigan, he should be talking about Ohio State because that's his biggest problem. And, Lou, I tell you what, I agree with you. I think Ohio State is a better football team than people in the nation thinks, and I think they match up a be, a, against LSU a lot better physically. I've seen them both. I think they physically they're better than people think. Oh, I think they're excellent. And this is Jim Trestle's type football team. When he won the championship, he had a quarterback named Krenzel. He's a lot like Beckman. Doesn't make many mistakes, throws the ball well. He has skilled players at wide receiver Rubisky and Hartline. He has a big offense line, great running back Chris Wells. And they play great defense, and they're well-disciplined. Jim Trestle knows how to win championships. He won a lot of them at Youngstown State. He's won one at Ohio State, and I think he will win two. I don't know about you guys, but I was checking out the mannerisms of Coach Trestle and Coach and, and Miles, and wait a minute. They just backed into a national championship game, number one and number two loss for the first time ever in the BCS era, and I didn't see any emotion. It's like, okay, we're going to play this team. We're going to line up. Our young men are doing this. We're excited. <laughs> are you kidding? 
kidding me? Yeah. They're playing for the national championship. I'd be doing hey, backflips. They got a month. They got a month. Yeah, but I yeah, still be doing. This is now. Enjoy it now. That's true. That's a good point. First of but all, you've got to hold first, your yeah. poise like I do. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Paying on the deck. You guys got to know that Coach Tressel. That's just it is. Yeah. What it is. I don't care. He, he could win ten million dollars in the lottery. And it's you know it's a very exciting day for us. We'll move on. And Les Miles, I think he realized last night after the upsets that his team was going to have a shot. So I think their excitement. LSU was having a little party there in the background. I just want to see which team takes the field in the underdog mindset because don't forget, seven of the nine times the underdog team has shown up, they've won the game outright. So which team shows up into this game, championship game, after a long layoff, more determined when they take the field? That's going to be a big factor in this game. I'm going to make you a prediction. Listen, Quick one. This will be the highest price ticket in the history a lot of the CCS. Yeah, because the betcha. Buckeye fans are not going to let now, nope. LSU take over that stadium. It may be too late. They, 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 they had a big claim a long time ago. We'll continue on our bowl selection special, a team that is going to a BCS game and a major bowl game for the first time since the 60s. Kansas moving in to the FedEx Orange Bowl. We'll talk Jayhawks in just a little bit. Also, Pete Carroll will join us. said Trojans only play at the Rose Bowl, and that seems to be the case. USC going back to the Rose Bowl game presented by City, the traditional Pac-10 Big Ten matchup. It will be on New Year's Day against Illinois. Joining us now is head coach of the Trojans, Pete Carroll, at least a share of six straight Pac-10 titles, and some believe the team is playing better than any other in the country right now. Pete, what are your thoughts about your team not quite making it to the national championship game? Well, you know, that came down to the system and all. I, I, I think the system is what it is, I, and I don't know how it works, so I can't really, I can't complain about it. I just know that we love to be playing. We love to still be playing football games and figure out who the best team in the country is. Well, how do you think your team is playing right now? Well, we're playing really well right now. This is the, uh, this is the team we had hoped to become during the season. You know, we had, a, we had our big bumps there in the middle when we got banged up and fell apart a little bit physically. But as soon as we got well, we came back roaring. We've had a great finish. Our defense is really, really playing well, and we're really balanced out well offensively. So we've got a very good football team right now. When you started the season with all of the talent and people saying perhaps it could be your best team ever, certainly at least your best defense ever, what were your expectations of this team? Well, that, that we could become what the team we are right now, that we could play this kind of defense. You know, we haven't given up much of anything for a while. Uh, and, and it's hard to move the football. It's hard to get anywhere on us. Offensively, we play efficient football, and we're hard to beat when we're like that. So this is what we had hoped to become. You know, it's hard to compare it from year to year, but uh, when you compare it around the country, you know, we'd love to still be playing against the best teams in the country and, and see a playoff system will allow us to do that. What do you think kept it from clicking the way you wanted it to sooner? Was it as simple as injuries? We were hurt, yeah. John David broke his hand in the, in the uh, Stanford game, and, and he wanted to keep playing, and I let him keep playing, and I should have taken him out. And uh, uh, that was just a big mistake for us, you know, and it, it, it bit us in the tail. He threw four picks in the second half. He's never done that ever, you know. So that's really where we, we, we dropped the game, and it was a great job by Stanford and Jimmy Harbaugh and all those guys, but that's where we messed up. And then we, uh, we went the next three weeks with uh, Mark Sanchez doing the best he could. He played really well, and we couldn't get Oregon up there on the road. And uh, we had a last chance, you know, last drive to win it and or to get down there and have a chance to tie it, and uh, we didn't get it done, you know. So those are our two games. From that point on, we've played really good, and, and we've, we've come back together, and, and uh, we're playing the football that we were capable of playing early in the year, and, and, and we're, so we're proud of that. Six straight years, you've had at least a share of the Pac-10 title. What does that mean to you? 
It means a great deal. Uh, you know, we, all we ever want to do around here is win forever, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, to, you know, last year was the first time anybody had ever won it five times in a row. And so to win it six times in a row is, is you know, staking a claim on, on a, a real good run here. And we're really proud of that. I like the long-term consistency. I mean, I, to win one time, one, you know, get the ring one time, that doesn't mean a lot to me. It's to show that you can win over a long period of time, maintain the excellence and the, and the standard that, that, uh, that maybe separates you from a lot of other programs. Pete, how do you think it compares trying to get your team's mindset just right, playing a traditional power that's been there a lot of times in Oklahoma, Texas, Michigan, teams that you've played before, versus a team on the rise like Illinois? It doesn't matter to us. You know, we, we, we have a way of dealing with, with the, our matchups uh, regardless of where they come from or who they are, or what their record is, or what the setting is. And, and this falls right in line with our approach. You know, uh, uh, this is a really good football team. We don't know anything about them at all. We're going to learn about them. We love that they're from the Big Ten. Uh, We've got to find out, you know, uh, what it takes to beat these guys. And that's how we go about it every week. We play every game as a championship game, and we always have. And, and this is another one of those. It's the Rose Bowl championship. Pete, another great season for your team. Congratulations on the Pac-10 title. Look forward to seeing them play in the Rose Bowl. All right, thank you very much. Pete Carroll, the head coach of the Trojans, joining us. And it will be 4.30 Eastern time. It will be on ABC, Illinois, and Southern California. Illinois making the Rose Bowl for the first time since 1983. It's the second time the Fighting Illini have made it to a BCS game in 2002. They made it to the Sugar Bowl, but now they will take on the Trojans in that traditional matchup for the Big Ten that is so important in America's heartland to make it out to Pasadena. It validates your program's rise in many ways. And the man responsible for getting that done for Illinois is Ron Zook, head coach of the Illini, and he joins us now on our bowl selection special. Uh, Ron, what was your reaction when you found out your team was going to Pasadena? Well, obviously it was a it was a great thrill. I'm happy for you know for the Illini Nation. I'm happy for our players and to have an opportunity to, to go to the Rose Bowl number one, and then obviously have an opportunity to play a great football team uh, like SC. And you know we talk to our players all the time about you know you, if you know if you're a competitor, you want to play the best. And you know this is a football team that uh, you know is playing as good as anybody in the country right now. How do you explain what it means to a team from the Big Ten to make the Rose Bowl? Well, you know, I, growing up in Ohio, I, I know a little bit about the traditions of, you know, uh, of the Rose Bowl and what it means to the Big Ten. And obviously, it's a it's a great great tradition. It's, uh, you know, it's the, it's the Rose Bowl. It's the you know it's the granddaddy of them all. And it's it's actually a, a bowl that I've always uh, I wanted to have the opportunity to coach in. What does it do to validate the rise of your program? Well, you know, I, I think you, we're still con you continuing to do that, and I think you know, once again, you know, our football team has done the things that we felt like we had to do. Uh, we played a very, very tough Big Ten conference schedule, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're for the most part uh, successful. You know, we had a couple bumps along the way, as, as, as most teams do, uh, but I think this football team has, has let our coaches coach them. Uh, they've worked extremely hard, and uh, you know, a little bit like SC is, you know, we're probably playing our best football right now as well. You are two years removed, Ron, from 63-10 losses, 61-14, 40-2. How did you sell your program to recruits and get it turned around like this? Well, we got a lot of things here to sell. We really do, and and uh, it's a great, great place. Uh, people make a place. Our coaching staff's done a great job, and uh, you know we just keep we keep uh, the the players have bought in, uh, and that's why you, you feel so good for them. Our seniors have never been to a bowl, and uh, to have the opportunity to go to such a prestigious bowl as this, uh, have an opportunity to play a, a great football team like this, and uh, they're excited about it. They're looking forward to it, and they know it's going to be a great challenge. Uh, and and it's just you, you, it makes you feel good uh, that they've been able to to accomplish. This. What's an example of some of the excitement you saw when they found out they were going to play USC? Well, they, you, there was a lot of excitement, and, and of course, you know, everybody knows SC, and they know uh, the kind of team that they are, and to have the opportunity to go and represent the Big Ten Conference, and, you know, uh, one of the players said to me, you know, uh, they, you know, we, we played one number one team already, they're a pretty good team at their place, uh, you know, we're going to go out there and, uh, and, and do the best that we can. You promised Juice Williams when he was a recruit that someday it would be different from those days a couple of years ago. That promise has come true. Ron, congratulations. Look forward to seeing you in the Rose Bowl. Thank you, Reese. I appreciate it. Ron Zook, the head coach at Illinois, a spectacular season for the Illini. It's going to culminate with a dream trip to Pasadena. Georgia's going to have a pretty good trip as well. We'll talk dogs in a bit. Stand goal, Brennan corner to the end zone.
zone. Touchdown. Ryan Grice Mullen. Hunker down in Hakka in the All-State Sugar Bowl. New Year's night, 8.30 Eastern time. Hawaii getting in. They finished comfortably 10th in the BCS standings. The final one, they'll take on the dogs. You see what Georgia has done. Third Sugar Bowl appearance in the BCS era. One of them played in Atlanta because of Hurricane Katrina when the Louisiana Superdome was not able to host that. Hawaii leading the nation, scoring over 46 points per game. Georgia in the top 20 in defense. I tell you, dogs haven't seen passing offense like the one that's going to come rolling in to New Orleans to take them on. But Georgia's had a transformation and attitude mayday since the celebration against Florida. Well, they learned how to dance. Well, they can hock it with Hawaii. There you maybe. go. And Urban Meyer, uh, perhaps discombobulated, and Richt was grinning about it. So uh, Mark Richt has sort of transformed this team. They got hot, much like USC, much like Ron Zook said. Illinois, those teams all playing their best football at the end of the season. Georgia's included in that group. Uh, we kind of kid about that and what happened in Jacksonville there, but it did. It changed the, mm -hmm. that attitude of that football team around from that point on. From that touchdown on, Georgia played with fire. They played with emotion. No matter who they played, it didn't matter because they showed up ready to go. In my opinion, Colt Brennan could score. But if he's on the sideline, he can't score. And I think you're going to see Georgia's big, powerful offensive line, the running of Sean Marino and Thomas Brown, running the football, controlling the clock, and trying to keep Colt Brennan on the sideline because, guys, it's not just Colt Brennan. Lee, you've been, watching, you've been talking about Colt Brennan all year. The group of wide receivers that he has is amazing. You've got to keep them on the sideline and run the football if you're Georgia. But one of the best hidden secrets about a wise football team is their improvement on defense. Last year, they were 96th in the nation in total defense and scoring defense. This year, 31st. In fact, they got behind 21 to nothing in the first quarter because of turnovers. Then they turned around and played great defense. Greg McMacken, the new defensive coordinator who was at Miami and the National Football League. Lou, this guy's done a tremendous job. It's a good-looking football team on defense. They're sound. I know they're not really as sound as good as some of these other teams, but they'll hit you, and they're well coached. You, you just said the key Thank word there. They play physical. They have good quickness. They get after you, and they're a very dangerous football team. I would not want to play him. And the fact that two things are going to help Georgia. One, the last time they're in the Sugar Bowl, they got beat by West Virginia. The other thing that'll help them, that Boise State from the same conference as Hawaii beat Oklahoma in the Fiesta Bowl last year. All right, we'll find out just how much Mark Rick thinks that's going to help his dogs. And joining us now is the head coach at the University of Georgia, Mark Rick. Mark, I know given where you sat in the BCS rankings last week, you thought perhaps your team had a chance to play for the national championship game. What was your reaction when you found out that you would not be playing for the national title? Well, it didn't surprise me. You know, after I saw the coaches poll come out early in the day and we were fourth, it was pretty, pretty obvious we weren't going to be able to do that. And, and if it was LSU who was going to go in to the national championship game, it was pretty obvious we'd end up in the, in the sugar. So... I'm excited about it. Uh, June Jones is a great coach. Uh, Colt Brennan, great quarterback, great football team, a team that no one's been able to beat, and uh, we'll see if we can do it. Now, Lou said it was going to help your players, he thought, at least getting focused what Boise State did to Oklahoma last year. What impact do you think that will have on your guys? Well, I think, you know, that's a lesson hopefully that we can learn, but uh, the bottom line is uh, Hawaii's good enough to beat anybody in the country on any given day, whether or not Boise did it to Oklahoma or not. Uh, doesn't matter how ready we are. I thought we were ready to play West Virginia, but they took it to us. Uh, they were a heck of a football team, uh, and I think everybody in the nation sees that now. Now, we did have three turnovers that day to their zero. That probably hurt us more than whether we were ready or not to play. How much have you been able to see of Hawaii this season? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a voter, and I usually wait. I usually vote at night after the game because I'm usually I usually have some adrenaline going on and and it's usually Hawaii the last team who's ranked that's playing so I end up watching them uh, I watched them a good bit this year they're very very impressive came back for some for, from some deficits that uh, most people would not have been able to do well, you said you were a voter where did you rank your team on your ballot I voted as number two. I had Ohio State one, and I had Georgia number two. So give me your case then. You told me the reasons that you realized why LSU yeah. is in the game rather than you. 
what do you think your best case for getting right. in was? Well, first of all, we were, we were number four in the BCS uh, just a couple days ago. And uh, everybody knew at that moment there was no chance that we could win the conference championship. And it became a much bigger issue this week than it was last week. No one seemed to care that much about it last week. They voted us because I think they thought we were one of the best teams in the nation. And I think, I really do believe that the media spun this thing where if you didn't win the conference championship, you're out. Which I didn't think was fair because the BCS rules don't keep a, a, a non-championship team from, from getting in the game. And, and I think everybody said, hey, Georgia's out because they didn't win the conference and didn't really give us a fair comparison. Do I think we'd have made it otherwise? Uh, you know, I don't know, but uh, I certainly felt like we got disqualified by a rule that didn't even exist. Do you think the rule should exist? Well, I, yeah, I, probably. If you ask me, do I think it's important to, for a conference team, I mean a conference champion to be in the national championship, I would, I would say yes. But the rule wasn't in place. I, I, would, I would say uh, that it should be in place, and that way teams like us don't have to get our heart broken on the last <laughs> day. Hey, we've seen you uh, sort of transform, or at least it appears that way publicly, from the celebration in Florida to the black jerseys. How do you compare Mark Rick, the head coach now, versus Mark Rick, who used to be consumed with calling the plays on offense? Well, I think that's the big difference. You know, when I was calling the plays, you know, I was thinking uh, my, my goal during the game was to stay peaceful. I needed my mind to be clear so I could think. That's how I felt like I functioned the best for the team. And even between series, I was thinking about what to do the next series. So I was very preoccupied with, with that job. And now that I'm not making decisions, there's still decisions I need to make game day, but nothing like it was before. I got a little bit more time to, to go ahead and let my emotions go. And uh, I think the players enjoyed it. And, and I, quite frankly, have enjoyed it a lot more. Oh, have, you, have you noticed a difference in yourself and the way you feel and the way you handle yourself during the week? Well, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, when you are constantly thinking about the game plan and, and setting the, uh, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the plan from the very beginning of the week, you know, starting Sunday night through Thursday night, you know, uh, you're very preoccupied with that job. Plus trying to handle the head coaching job and that responsibility makes for a really busy guy and a very tired guy. And uh, by not having to do all that game planning, it allowed me to think a little bit more about, you know, game planning energy, game planning uh, uh, excitement. You know, I told the team when, when our energy uh, collides with our execution, we got a chance to be a great football team. And, and I think that's what happened uh, from, that, from that Tennessee game on. Mark, you've experienced one of the issues that we're going to see in the national championship game. Bo Pelini, the defensive coordinator at LSU, is now the head coach at Nebraska. You were in the same situation, Florida right. State to Georgia. How should a coordinator handle right. that when he's ready to move on to another job? Uh, if I had to do it again, I would, I would move on. I'd have told Coach Bowden, I love you and I love Florida State, and because I love you, I, it might be better for me to go on so, so everybody can can really concentrate. I, I really and truly tried my best to give everything I had to Florida State. But in hindsight, I don't believe I did a very good job. Now, Bo, Bo might be able to do it. I found out that I was not a very good multitasker, and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't handle it very well. Uh, as, even though my heart was there, I don't think uh, I did a great job, quite frankly. And the well, results showed that. Uh, Mark, how about coming up with uh, something special, some jerseys or something for the Sugar Bowl, okay? You got a month to think about it. <laughs> oh, we're going, we're, we're going, hey, we're going black jersey. We're going to try to black out the dome. Okay, all right. Mark Rick, the head coach of Georgia. Mark, always a pleasure. Congratulations on a great season. Thank you. All right, so Mark Rick and the dogs a little disappointed, as you can understand. And you know what? I, I mean, I think it's a very fair point to say that they didn't win their division. Rick also makes some pretty good points. That rule's not in there. It's not written. Maybe somebody should write it, but it's not there now. And Georgia actually slips a spot. But I think you could also make the argument that the teams that passed the mark actually accomplished something while they were on the sideline. Oklahoma, Virginia Tech, LSU, all of those teams ended up winning a conference championship. Yeah, and they should move ahead of Georgia, in my opinion. And if you look at a team that hasn't won their division and hasn't won their conference championship, how can you have that team play for a national championship? I don't think it's fair to the other teams that have accomplished that.
Well, is it based on who's the best team or who did the best over the entire course of the season against the weakest schedule? So. So what do you think? What well, do you think? Well, I just want to say this about Georgia. I mean, he, he's right. The last two or three weeks, including myself, I think most of us on this set, talked about Georgia being one of the hottest teams in the country. It's a different debate about who's the hottest team and who's most the most deserving team. Because if we had a playoff right now, Georgia would be a team that I would put my money on that would advance in a playoff against a lot of teams that are up there in the top five right now. They're hot. They're confident, and they kind of have that it factor right now. This is not the NFL. This is college football. I don't want to hear about playoffs unless somebody comes up with a formula or somebody comes up and says not the rules have, have changed plus one. we have a playoff, plus then we one. don't have a playoff. But the plus. one thing about Georgia also in the fact is that they had their chance under the system that we have in place, the BCS, to get up there. They failed. It's like when you go before a judge and he says, guilty, next case, and the discussion. Next guy walks in, next guy walks out. He had a chance. All he had to do was continue to He shouldn't have lost to South Carolina, and he wouldn't have had this problem. I, I think that Mark Rick has done Judge. a tremendous job coaching. I, I would make him one of my strongest candidates for coach of the year, but I would not make Georgia one of the candidates for team of the year. That's it. Yeah. By the way, did you hear his own opinion? If, if he removed mm -hmm. his team, he, he thinks there should be a rule that, that states you have to win your conference to, to get into the national title. Okay, let me throw a hypothetical at you then. What if you have a conference championship game, weak division, team with three or four losses beats an undefeated team? They're not conference champions. It's March Madness, baby. Okay. That's You're eliminating. Well, don't go basketball on him now. He's going to get up and start dribbling. <laughs> I you not. How, how would that be different from the drooling that you guys leave me doing sometimes when you beat me up a little bit here? Hey, you probably notice on the side of the screen you're having a chance most of the time until just seconds ago to have a look at all of the matchups <laughs> for the 32 bowl games. You'll continue to be able to do that throughout our bowl selection special. We'll continue here. The entire guys, is this the guy who has landed the Heisman Trophy? We'll seeing what they think. Florida's Tim Tebow, the Heisman front runner, where he is going to wind up playing his bowl game. We'll talk about the Gators in a little bit. Best game, but it's always right there on the cusp in terms of attractiveness of the matchup. Lloyd Carr's final game going against Urban Meyer in Florida and the Heisman front runner, it would seem, in Tim Tebow. Meyer 4 0 in bowl game. Tebow, just a ridiculous number of touchdowns this season, Mark. I mean, you look what Tim Tebow's accomplished. Everybody talks about the number of touchdowns. It's how he's really directed this offense, running down the field of play, making plays with his arms and legs. But not only that, he carries this football team. I think he has the intangibles. I think we saw that last year on display, the emotions, the passion. He has such a genuine feel for this team. And, Lou, one of the things I think you appreciate, talking to Urban Meyer earlier today, I'm sure you talked to him too, some of the numbers that he's put up. Oh. Urban Meyer believes there's no debate. Hey, this guy's the Heisman Trophy. Hey, when you look at it, everybody can talk about 51 touchdowns. Let's remember number one. He lost nine defensive starters off last year's national championship team. But they are 56% on third down. 50, that's a record. In addition to that, they have scored 55% of the times they've had the ball. Every time they get the ball, 55% they score, and 48.8% .8 of those or a touchdown. That's unbelievable. And it's all because of the left-handed quarterback. You think he should win the Heisman? He's a sophomore, Lou. I don't care. The mayor of Hillsdale, Michigan, 18 years old. It doesn't say the Heisman should be a guy who's on a great football team. doesn't say the Heisman should be a junior or senior or on the best team. Should be the best player, and that's Tim Tebow. And one thing about Tim Tebow, you know, we look about his running and passing, but let me tell you something also. Tim Tebow right now, passing efficiency is higher than any other quarterback that's ever won the Heisman. Any other quarterback that's won the Heisman. Now, Lou, you and I have been around. The only player that I've ever seen live and in color, Roger Staubach, oh. is a better runner and thrower than this guy ever. I mean, quarterback, single wing tight. Mm -hmm. Never seen a guy better than him, but maybe with the exception of 1963 when Roger Staubach won the Heisman with Navy. He was a junior. That you're That's right. I, the, the matchup itself, you touched on Lloyd Carr, this being his final chance to go out and coach Michigan. you got to wonder if this team's going to rally around that. They tried to rally around that against Ohio State. <laughs> Didn't seem to work too well for them. See if they're healthy when they come back. See how the, the time off allows Mike Hart, the rest of this offense, to get in gear, especially the quarterback, Chad Henney. Michigan will come into this game a decisive underdog 
from the Big Ten going up against the speed. Urban Meyer being from Ohio, very familiar with the state of Michigan and what they have to offer as a football team. But I think there is a clear advantage psychologically, athletically. Florida should win this game and win it big. I totally agree with you, and here's the reason why. Spread offense. That's why the last time you saw <laughs> this Michigan defense face the spread offense against Oregon, against Appalachian State, they got roasted. Now all of a sudden you're going to face a spread offense with Tim Tebow, 51 total touchdowns. Are you kidding me? He's going to run up and down the field. They're not going to stop him. Let me ask you a question, Mark. Does it make any difference to you that Tebow is a different style runner than Armonte Edwards of Appalachian State or Dennis Dixon of Oregon in the spread? No, not at all, because he's bigger and stronger and just as fast. So he's got to be more devastating against this defense. You know what else? Not only is he strong, Stronger and he's maybe not as quick, but the guys that happen to circle around him in motion, he hands it off to and he throws to, that kind of speed is what always has given Michigan secondary fits. Tebow's threat of running and then the threat of throwing into those seams of that Michigan defense, he, he's what a way to cap off the year that he's had. Let me tell you, that guy's name is going to beat Michigan. Percy Harvin. Yeah. Percy Harvin is the finest, exciting football player in the nation right now. I tell you what, he's got more yardage and bigger plays than anybody in the country as a receiver and a runner. Well, Andre Caldwell is pretty good. But I think Florida will be the best football team in the bowl game this year, and that includes Ohio State and LSU. Why? Because they're so young on defense. This is like having another spring practice. It'll be a completely different football, de a football team and a different defense than what Florida's shown all year. I thought you'd say they'd be the best team in the bowl games this bowl season because they're playing Michigan's defense. That could be true, too. <laughs> hey, let, that could be true. Okay, let me ask you. Tebow, your Heisman front runner? He's the front runner, He's I think. I, I mean, I've gone back and forth okay. with McFadden and Tebow. Tebow probably right now. And you? Studying. Votes not due to the fifth. I know, but you were I, leaning toward? I put it in today. And you? And it was? Tebow. And you? I don't vote. I, but it's Tebow. It would be Tebow put, and McFadden and Brennan. and I sent, I sent mine in today. Tebow number one, Brennan number two. Okay. Uh, Tim Tebow joins us now Brennan. on the phone. Tim, by our informal straw poll here, it appears that you are the Heisman front runner. Uh, what's your reaction to all of the attention you've gotten for the Heisman Trophy candidacy? It's an award that I've uh, you know dreamed about getting opportunity to go to and, and watch since I was very young and watch you know, Tommy Fraser and Danny Werfel and guys like that win it. So, you know, it's just an honor for me to you know, even be mentioned with it. Tim, what do you think of the numbers that you've put up this year? Have you stopped and had a look at your stat sheet? 51 touchdowns. That, that's Xbox stuff. Well, you know, I didn't really stop during the season to look at it at all. But, you know, after the season, you know, me and some of the coaches looked at it and we're pretty happy. We know we could have, you know, done better this year. Um, but it wasn't too bad. So we were pretty excited about it. What, are you going to break out a jump pass against Michigan at any point? Uh, I think we'll have one, you know, just in case. <laughs> hey, Tim, go ahead, Mark. Hey, Mark. Tim, we watch you a lot, and I always say on here that where are you running? Where's he running, Reese? And Reese always says? Left. <laughs> running are, left. Are you going to start uh, running to the right more? <laughs> uh, you know, we'll run where, wherever it's open. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I know you always think we're running left, but to me it seems like we're running both ways, so. Hey, hey, Tim, it's Kirk. Uh, going up against Michigan, a team that uh, is playing their last game for their coach, the, the speed advantage that, that you guys have over them is pretty obvious. What are, what are your initial thoughts on that matchup against Michigan? Well, I think they're going to be a, a very physical team, a team that uh, you know, probably outweighs us and you know, pretty physical. I think uh, you know, also they'll be fired up you know, with uh, Coach Carr you know, retiring and leaving. And it'll give them a little bit of edge and you know reason to go out there and play their hearts out. And so, you know, always you got to be careful when playing a team like that and they have a reason to go out there and leave everything on the field. And so we're going to have to come with our best game and be ready to go. Hey, Tim, how difficult is it for you to practice with that cast on your non-throwing hand? Or do you just rub a little kryptonite on it? Or what's the <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, it is a little difficult, you know, doing like the options and, you know, different reads and stuff like that. But as far as throwing, it's not too bad. What would you say, Tim, was your defining performance this year? What was your favorite moment? Well, you know, I had several of them. Beating Tennessee at the beginning of the year uh, was kind of a good way to start it. Uh, but then the way we finished, you know, versus Florida State, probably our biggest rival of everybody. And, you know, having, having that final game was uh, pretty memorable. What is the best thing about being Tim Tebow on campus in Gainesville? Uh, 
Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, the best thing is having the opportunity and platform to, you know, influence, you know, a lot of kids and, you know, a lot of Gator fans and, you know, having that opportunity and that, you know, ability to, you know, maybe, you know, influence people and put a smile on some people's faces. Hey, Tim, it's the Florida State game. Gino Hayes made some comments leading up to it. I never heard on the back end if you had if, if you guys made any contact during the game. Whatever happened with that on the field? Did he have any words for you or vice versa? Well, he, he did have some, have some words, especially at the beginning of the game. But uh, you know, uh, the words slowly stopped as the game went on. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's about all. He, he, he's a good player, and, you know, people get fired up and say stuff, so, you know. You go back and look at the tape on the touchdown run you had when you avoided a player in the backfield. I think Geno Hayes was one of the guys chasing Tim Tebow and did not catch him. Uh, Tim, uh, Lou Holtz, uh, what do you feel you have to improve upon? I, I mean, I watch film, and I watch you practice down there and talk to you after. What do you think you need to improve on? I think it's it's the things that you know I was working on this whole whole year to improve on that's being patient and you know more at the earlier the earlier this year uh, you know I'd want to make a play I'd go out there and try to make plays instead of letting things happen I think as the year went on you know I, I did a better job of you know trying to let things happen ch- take the check down and not always having to make a big play. Uh, and, you know, knowing that you can throw it away or, you know, check it down. And, and so just being patient like that and understanding uh, exactly what's going on and get us into the perfect play, uh, you know, every every play and not just, you know, some of the time. So. Well, Tim, you might have gotten the biggest compliment of all. I was uh, getting on Emmett Smith's case today telling him that a quarterback was breaking all of his rushing <laughs> touchdown records, and he said as long as a quarterback like you, it was okay. <laughs> well, that's a big honor, uh, <laughs> Thing that he was my favorite player when I was growing up, and you know something else was funny. You know, Sean Alexander is a pretty good friend of mine. I was talking to him Friday, and I was giving him a hard time too because I think he only had 19, you know, for Alabama. So <laughs> he, he was tied for the SEC record until you came along, Tim. Uh, best of luck in the Capital One Bowl against Michigan. Thanks for spending time with us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I tell you, the guys that Tebow passed for that SEC rushing touchdowns record this year, Sean Alexander that Tim mentioned, LeBrandon Tofield from LSU, and Garrison Hurst from Georgia, those are some guys who could tote the rock pretty well, huh? You know, the amazing thing to me, and, I, and Kirk will verify this, I was skeptical of his throwing ability. And we talked about it at the beginning of the season. You know, I watched him last year. Yeah. But to end up the season with the highest passing efficiency rating than any other quarterback that's ever won the Heisman, to me, I mean, that's a hell well, of a statement. But let, let's not forget, he's in the SEC. I mean, think about the defenses that he went up against. How Remember when, when Urban Meyer came to Gainesville? He can't run that offense in the <laughs> SEC. He <laughs> cannot that. run this offense in the <laughs> SEC. It's too physical. The linebackers are going to hit you. The safeties are too fast. You can't do it. No one wants well, to do well, no, Wait a are. minute, though. But I'm just, don't I'm not, I don't a know guy, a guy that beats up. Everybody that, said it. Yeah, I know. But, I mean, I'm saying you get a guy once in a lifetime quarterback like well, this man that can take that kind of punishment. See, he's revolutionizing okay. this spread offense. Yeah. Because <laughs> instead of Pat White and Dennis Dixon and these guys that have tremendous quickness, yeah. this guy's doing it like RoboCop. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's running through people. He's running by people. He's throwing over top of people. I don't think we've ever seen it. It's beyond the numbers. It's not yeah. just the numbers with this guy. It's how he's doing it. Urban asked me to come up and watch him practice, and I came up here the first week, and I said, I watched Tim Tebow throw and warm up. And they all oh, had that very And he got in team, and there's something about him. He has timing. He has peripheral vision, and he can just sense when to throw the ball. I've never seen anything anybody, I've never seen anybody any better at it. What's scary about it? He's a sophomore. That's and he's why a hard he, worker, and that, he's going to get better and better. That's the scary thing. That's about why him. he shouldn't win the Heisman. He's a sophomore. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and that's the other point, though. Uh, at some point, they're going to have a running back who's going to get a lot of these touchdowns, too. He's probably, he doesn't care no chances. Oh, no, I know he doesn't yeah. care. I'm just saying the likelihood of putting up uh, 51 touchdowns again <sighs> next year and whatever he does in the bowl game uh, certainly uh, doesn't seem likely, and he might still be a better player, but not the same type of numbers that he put up this year. Another guy that's a pretty good run-pass threat will be on display in the Cotton Bowl. Run DMC, Darren McFadden, who's done a little bit of passing out of that wild hog formation. Arkansas and Missouri. Mizzou, disappointing loss to Oklahoma, kept them from playing for the national championship. They're going to a January Bowl for the first time since 1968. Arkansas struggled in bowls. Reggie Herring is the interim coach. Hogs in search for a head coach as Houston Nutt has moved on to Ole Miss. What impact do you think this is going to have on Arkansas, Lou? 
Oh, I think it'll have a big impact uh, to a certain extent because Houston Nutt was a great leader, and he, he was a heck of a football coach. He was there for 10 years, and he did one heck of a fine job. He liked to run the football, and he utilized Darren McFadden and Felix Jones, and it won't make that big of a difference in terms of the players, but in terms of leadership, yeah. I don't think it's got to make a big difference on how they play because you've got two great running backs in Darren McFadden and Felix Jones, and all you got to do is whoosh, hand the ball off to them in this bowl game. So it's not going to be a great mystery on the game plan. You're going to hand the ball to those two great backs, and they're going to chew up the clock, chew up yardage, and put points on the board. I think we'd all probably agree this is probably Darren McFadden's last game as an Arkansas Bye -bye. Razorback. So he'll probably have some motivation to want to go out the right way. Adrian Peterson tried to do that last year in his last bowl game. I, you know, I, I wonder how Missouri's going to respond. I mean, they're, they're a game away from getting to the national championship. They fall short at the end, and now they have to go to a lesser bowl. They're not even in the BCS. I'm just going to I'm going to be very interested to see if Chase Daniel and the rest of the Tigers can rebound emotionally right. and get back to play against Arkansas. I think we saw a snapshot of this game in the last half of uh, the, the game we saw with Oklahoma, where Oklahoma in the second half just completely demolished them with an offensive line and a running attack. And Chase Daniel hardly got into the ball game. In fact, I don't think they, this is the first time in the year they haven't, didn't score a touchdown. I don't think he didn't throw, he didn't throw a touchdown pass for the first time in his career. The reason why the perfect team like Arkansas, offensive line, run the ball, undersized defense Missouri is. Mm -hmm. Aggressive, hard playing undersized. Arkansas will just run the ball and keep it away from them. And don't forget about it. Everybody thinks it's just Darren McFadden. Don't worry about it. We'll try to stop him. Yeah. Felix he's, Jones oh, now. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's a horse. Yeah. He's a, well, it's when they get in that what do they call it? The, the hog, wild hog. The wild hog formation. If you got Felix Jones coming in motion, you got Darren McFadden keeping it. And Darren McFadden throwing the ball as well. So. That's it. He's been, uh, he's, he's been effective throwing the ball. I asked him earlier this season if he thought he could be a full-time quarterback, and he, he said, yeah, if I'd probably started that way, I could have. He's confident in his passing. Threw a touchdown pass against LSU that looked pretty sweet. Probably his last game remains to be seen if Felix Jones sticks around, too. He also could decide to come out when you average nine yards of carry. I guess there will be some demand for your services both at both levels. Wisconsin finished up strong making it into a New Year's Day Bowl. They, too, have a foe from the SEC. Badgers, Big Orange, we'll talk about it coming up. Four teams playing in the preseason, one of the 32 games, the Gator Bowl. And, you know, the Gator Bowl has arrangements with the Big East, Notre Dame, and with the Big 12. And this year, taking a team from the Big 12, Texas Tech won four of its last five bowl games against Virginia, Algro doing a fine job with the Cavaliers and getting them very close to playing for the ACC title. They're going to their fifth bowl in the last six seasons. In the Outback, that'll be New Year's morning, 11 Eastern time on ESPN. Wisconsin taking on Tennessee. Tennessee resurgent after a little bit of a shaky start. Finished strong, played in the SEC championship game for falling to LSU yesterday. Lobbed the left man wide open. Touchdown, Illinois! Brian Gamble! And they've upset the number one Buckeye. Moving left side, Wells, 40, 45, Wells to the 50 with one defender to the beat. Middle of field to the 40, to the 30, Chris Wells, middle of field, 20, 10, 5, touchdown! Just like last year in Columbus. Who would have thought after that Michigan game that Chris Wells and the Buckeyes are going to spit out those roses? They're going to New Orleans instead of Pasadena. National championship game, LSU and Ohio State. Buckeyes hoping to atone for last year's loss to Florida in the national title game. And joining us now on the phone, the quarterback of the Buckeyes, Todd Beckman. And Todd, I know you guys needed an upset last night, and you were riveted to your television set waiting to find out if there would be a spot open in the national title game, right? I don't know about that. I was at a concert, actually. <laughs> so is it because you were so relaxed and you knew that you guys were going to get in? <laughs> well, I got, a, got the tickets about a month ago and, and didn't know it was going to come down to this. So what was the concert? It was actually a Brad Paisley concert. Was it more enjoyable when you got out of it and found out you were going to New Orleans? <laughs> well, I found out during the concert, and I missed probably the last couple songs, so uh, it was good to know. What was the feeling on the team after that loss to Illinois about your opportunity to bounce back and perhaps play for the national championship? 
we thought all of our goals of the national championship was pretty much over after that because um, we knew we'd fallen um, to seventh. And it's been, we've been very fortunate to have some teams lose here and have a, have a shot at national title again. Hey, Todd, uh, Ohio State 0-8 in the postseason against the SEC last year, 41-14 on the minds of many college football fans outside of Columbus, Ohio, in the state of Ohio. Some people feel Ohio State back in. They didn't really play anybody. They didn't deserve to be here in this national title. You think that's motivation for you guys to get ready to play another SEC powerhouse, let alone in their own stadium in New Orleans? Oh, I think it is. I think we've been into tough situations this year. We uh, traveled up to Penn State and Happy Valley, and that was a tough place to play. And uh, and obviously at Michigan a couple weeks ago. So I think uh, we're ready to go, go face LSU. It's going to be a tough crowd. It's going to be a great game, and we're looking forward to it. Now, coaches always say that the crowd, the noise, not going to be that big an issue. It is an issue for the quarterback. Uh, how would you compare the difficulty for a quarterback as opposed to the difficulty for a coach? Oh, it's definitely di uh, a little different there. We're out on the field. Um, we got to definitely use some hand signals and different things like that to prepare for it. And um, But uh, like I said, we've had some tests and some pretty uh, big atmospheres, and like I said, we're ready to go. Uh, Were you? Uh, go ahead, Lou. Go ahead. Uh, this is Lou Holtz. Uh, I want to tell you, you've never been in any place like LSU, trust me. But what <laughs> I really was interested in is how much have uh, you changed your offense from Troy Smith to today? I mean, you've had tremendous success. You provide a great leadership. Have you changed the concept or emphasized different areas of it? Oh, I guess there's not as much running with the quarterback. Um, Troy, first of all, was a great leader, did so many great things for us, and, and it was tough to come and replace him. Um, but we didn't really change too much. We pretty much had the base of our offense down, and, and obviously Beanie's having a great year, and our offense line is doing a great job blocking for him, and, and we're excited where we're at right now. Todd, I think a lot of people will probably look at this matchup and say it's the speed of LSU against the power of Ohio State from the Big Ten. Maybe those are stereotypes. Do you buy that, or do you think uh, – it's it's a maybe a few different angles to this game. I don't think so. I think we have some very quality athletes also with some with some great speed. Um, so we know they're they're going to be a great challenge for us, and and we're looking forward to it. Um, we're ready to go. And we've seen some of them a little bit. Um, and I think we have guys that can uh, keep up with them. Todd, last year one of the complaints was, well, we had to wait fifty some days for the championship game. You got the same situation this year. What are you going to do differently this year than last year? Well, I think we uh, we started this past week with some extra conditioning and lifting, and we got to stay focused, be prepared each and every week. Um, you can't get out of shape because we know this is a long layoff, and, and we got to take it each and every day, uh, one day at a time, because we know this is going to be a battle, and we got to study study the game, watch film every day, um, just do little things like that to stay fresh. But what's the toughest thing to get back, Todd, when you have a layoff like that? Just game situations. Um, you really don't see that in practice. It's not the same. The speed is the speed's so different. I'm going against scout teams, and it's really hard to have contact in practice because um, we hit so hard, and our defense is, has some great athletes over there. So that's probably the, the big thing, the, the speed of the game. Todd Dobb, this is Lee Corso. I'd like to ask you a question, and please, a little statement. I think you got the best offensive line in the nation in front of you. Tell me a little bit about that offensive line. I got to give them all the credit in the world. They've opened up some big holes for Beanie. Um, gave me so much time. Um, I'm starting with Kirk Barton. He he's been a tremendous leader for us. The, the only senior on the line. He's done some great things. And, and you got to give Jimmy Quarter a lot of credit to our center. Um, he he broke his his uh, bone in his hand uh, earlier in the year. He couldn't snap with his right hand. So he's been doing some great things. As is Alex Boone and Ben Person and Steve Erring. So I'm I'm really excited to have them in front of me. Todd, do us a favor and see if you can get Barton to speak his mind every now and then. Too. <laughs> <laughs> he, he loves to do that. That's definitely for sure. <laughs> hey, Todd, best of luck in the national championship game. Congratulations on a great first season as a starter. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Todd Beckman, the quarterback at Ohio State, who was so relaxed that spent the evening at a Brad Paisley concert, finds out the Buckeyes going to play for the national championship. That is a great story in the Big Ten, but uh, perhaps the best one from a human interest standpoint for the Big Ten in the postseason of the Bulls, the Indiana Hoosiers. When Austin Starr knocked through this field goal to win the old oaken bucket, it gave Indiana a chance to realize Terry Hefner's dream of playing 13. That's Terry Hefner's widow, Jane, Bill Lynch, and the interim coach, been named full-time coach for Indiana, leading the Hoosiers into the postseason. And on New Year's Eve afternoon, the Insight Bowl, Indiana will take on Oklahoma. Hoosiers going to a bowl for the first time since 1993. That's not true! <laughs>
That's the other guy. But Kellen Lewis has done an outstanding job at the quarterback position, 26 touchdowns, only 10 picks. He also leads the team in rushing, so it's going to be interesting this matchup against the offense, against Oklahoma State. It's going to be a high-scoring game, I think. Yeah, James Hardy can make plays for Indiana, one of the top receivers, biggest receivers in the country in Oklahoma State. Zach Robinson, they've been getting better and better on offense. And Mike Gundy got a contract extension as well, or was recommended that he receive a contract extension after the Pokes showed improvement in conference play this year. Chick-fil-A Bowl, December 31st, 7.30 Eastern Time. A couple of schools that some say are mirror images. In fact, uh, both beautiful campuses. Clemson's been referred to as Auburn with a lake sometimes. With Tigers versus Tigers. Clemson and Auburn, a lot of athletes on the field. There's a lake close to Clemson. There's not one close to Auburn. Well, I'm glad it's you, you can clean that up for everybody out yes. there because I didn't know what you were Most talking about. Most people understand that. What those running backs, South. James <laughs> Davis and C.J. Spiller, get the job done. <laughs> running the football for Clemson, they're both dynamic at that position. You know, of all, of all those bowls that are away from the BCS, maybe a second tier. This one will be, have the most rabid fan base in Atlanta. This will be a very excited environment. It is like two SEC schools, and both coaches need a win to kind of build that momentum into that next year. So where's the lake again? Which uh, Lake Hartwell is pretty close to Clemson. Okay. And remember one thing, uh, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A did not invent the chicken, <laughs> just the chicken sandwich. That would be good for some free chicken. I want to tell you. Somebody lives out there. They're nothing close to Clemson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now that you're not oh, leading the game I guess now that you're not leading the game cocks anymore, you can sit up there with the rifle and take a shot. But I'll tell you what, they've done a marvelous job. The amazing thing about Clemson, they started 18 underclassmen this year. They're going to be really good next year. Auburn's going to be good too. They started all those freshmen on the offensive, offensive line. line. They've got to replace their That's quarterback. Right. But Cody Burns got some. Time. You guys have been there, but I, I think playing in these bowl games. I know the fans just get caught up sometimes in the big games, but playing in these bowl games is significant to not only get the practice time, but winning the game. You cannot believe how much momentum that gives into winter conditioning and spring football, especially when you have 18 or 19 starters returning that next year. Ah, that's not important. What's I'm important is the you. swag bag. It's the iPods oh, yeah. and the DVD <laughs> players and the goodies. Yeah, but you laugh, but that will determine many times who wins a football game, because when they get to the site, the first thing they do is question, how's your gifts compared to our gift? Yeah. So one well, of the first thing you did, you got yeah. to Equipment, man. You got money. Senior. It's the spending money. Yeah, yeah. They, they pay. Well, how you got spending money? You're That's only important. allowed to give them X amount of money. But here's how you give them more money. You have a brunch. Oh. You don't have breakfast. You have lunch. You have a brunch. Good. Then you give them lunch the money. Of it. And they, they have brunch. And they pack a sandwich for lunch. And you can give them an extra meal. I mean, there's a lot of ways around it legally. So, you know, you know speaking, of, speaking about players enjoying it, I, I want to get back to the Indiana situation. Because this is one of the feel-good stories in all of college football. Coach Hebner, as you know, passed away before the season, and he, they wanted a bowl game so bad for him. And Bill Lynch, who was a former assistant of mine for t two years, took over the interim job. And you can't say enough about Coach Hebner's staff, his wife, and Billy Lynch on what they did to bring that football team together, the first bowl game in 14 years from Indiana. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is what college football is out about, all about. The Indiana players going to a bowl game in honor of their fallen coach. That's good stuff. You know, in a season that's been filled with emotion and surprises oh. and upset, very few moments as emotional as that one when Indiana beat Purdue and knew that they had pretty much sown up a spot in the postseason. Just can't tell you. Uh, Coach Holtz, the NCAA is online, too. Uh, they can be. It's perfectly <laughs> legal. We only gave them one meal. Not only that, you can give them the airline airfare. Line. They all get together the in airline. the car. That's they important. Hey, That's hey, the biggest hey, thing. Hey, I opened hey, up a can of worms hey, here. Hey, you laugh about it. You laugh about it. But I kid you not, it's one of the most important things about winning. And also, Damn. because as soon as they get together with the other team, they're going to wonder what kind of gifts you get. How much spending money? Why did they get more than us? Why did they? And also, when you go to the luncheon, where both teams are, you want to be the best dressed team there. I'm talking about Sweats. very neat, et cetera. <laughs> and right. the coach better be well prepared <laughs> when he speaks at the luncheon because you're going to speak in comparison with the other coach, and the players are always evaluating everything. So a lot of that game is won before you ever get to the field. Yeah, you start flying the off-brand sweats, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. That's not good. They're wondering why coach can't work a deal so with we, one of the big ones. Oh, that was a great man. lesson for pay them well. And get get them on the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the Pentagon hey, hey, uh, Independence Bowl. That is legally. Sunday night, 8 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN. Alabama, which really the wheels came off down the stretch for Nick Saban's team, his first Alabama club going to Shreveport to take on Colorado. How about Saban and a little hawk love? A little zen meditating, maybe for some of the pregame festivities there. Big 12 football. <laughs> Not in a girl, brother. <laughs>
I'm at Nick Saban back in Louisiana. I'm sure he's looking forward to that. Uh, it's that five days there. <laughs> <laughs> the Bolero Bowl, Alamo Bowl, Penn State, and Texas A&M. Texas A&M, yet another team that is going into this with some coaching unrest. I know they've Who's already hired him. Uh, it's it's going to be Gary Darnell. Sorry, Gary Darnell is the interim coach right now who was a coordinator under Dennis Franchoni. Mike Sherman, of course, still in the NFL with the Texans. He will take over as head coach after Franchoni's departure. That game, Saturday, December 29th. Also on Saturday, December 29th, another one of the positive stories from this season. The AutoZone Liberty Bowl, Central Florida, the nation's leading rusher, Kevin Smith, going against Sylvester Croom at Mississippi State as he got his team to a bowl. He's done an outstanding job there. And also, if you look what's done at Central Florida, how about this football team? They're outstanding also, but Sylvester Croom, what he's been able to do, some of the big losses that they had, this team has been able to respond and come back and win football games. He did a terrific job coaching this team. Yeah, I think it's about perseverance. It's taken him some time, but he's built it up the right way. I think one of the best scenes that I saw all year was the tears a pleasure that he had walking off the field after the Egg Bowl and getting into the... I want post. you guys to take a look at this, this guy, guy here. This he guy got this 181 yards and he breaks Barry Sanders' all-time rushing record. Right there, kid Kevin Smith from Miami for Central Florida, only a junior. And not only that, how about George O'Leary, the job oh, that he did? After being pasted by South Florida when they were 3-3, three and three, coming yeah. back and winning the eight in a row, yeah. and then winning the, the Conference sure. USA Championship. I mean, that's a tremendous job that people need to hear about these stories about Kevin Smith and George, George O'Leary, what they've yep. done down there. UCF's a good football team. Beautiful Very downtown good. Orlando. That's right. They've got a new on-campus facility that was flat rocking for the game against Tulsa. And Called the Bright House. That's a Bright House Network. Yeah, no, yeah just another plug. <laughs> just, well, no, I live in Orlando. You know, I have plenty. I have plenty. I'm going to get Bright House and chicken. Where do you live? Uh, whenever, yeah, you've got to share. <laughs> I live here, but my home's in Orlando where my <laughs> wife is. But obviously, I'm chained to this desk seven days a week, 15 <laughs> weeks out of the year. But my wife does live in Orlando. You have White House in your TV? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Kevin Smith, as, as Lee mentioned, could pass Barry Sanders. Yeah, Barry Sanders. And not, not at all to take away from what Kevin Smith's accomplished. It is fair to point out Sanders put his numbers up 26 12 in 11 games. This will be Smith's 14th game. Yeah. But he still he set a record from those kids. Carries this year. That's carries it. 415 times. And beat Marcus Allen. Yep, that's right. Great running back. Stud. Good. He has, and in Orlando, I understand you two Orlando gentlemen that uh, they're upset that he's not a finalist for the Dope Walker. Award. Absolutely. He goes, he should be the best running back in the country. Pacific Live Holiday Bowl, Thursday, December 27th, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Pac-10, Big 12, almost always highly entertaining, and now you got the Sun Devils in the long run. Well, this one's always a shootout, and you look at Arizona State with Rudy Carpenter and what they're doing this year. I know that uh, beating Arizona, they thought they maybe had a shot at the BCS, but this is a team that scores points. Colt McCoy, both, everybody has a chance to get healthy. I think it'll live up to the billing. I think there'll be a lot of points. No, yeah, Dennis Erickson, what he's been able to do in his first year, taking over this team from Dirk Cutter, basically the same players, brought in a few players from junior college, but he's been able to change the culture and the attitude at Arizona State in just one season. And their defense is so much better and so much more physical than they have been in past years. And they were on the cusp, too, of being under consideration, yep. certainly for a BCS sure. game with the way they played. I really thought they would be in the BCS. Instead, they're going to go to San Diego. They're going to be able to take on a Texas team that sort of stumbled around down the stretch. It'll be an opportunity, as Kirk mentioned a few minutes ago, to get a little bit of a feel-good finish to the season. Texas, Texas didn't have much of that after the way Longhorns played against Texas A&M in the regular season finale. The All-State Sugar Bowl, that's Georgia and Hawaii, and Hawaii has been uh, sort of holding on by its fingernails, trying to get into and stay in that top 12 in the BCS rankings. As it turns out, they finished 10th. They're in there comfortably. You know about the high-powered offense. Lou, how much trouble do you think Hawaii can give Georgia? Oh, I think they'll give them all they want. I think as a, they can run on defense. They're very, very physical. They're very athletic. And, and they have great camaraderie. I was interested in the players talking about recruiting, how they come together because they're all one just to carry. But they're a great offensive team. I think they'll give Georgia all they want. I think they can give anybody in the country all they want on a given day, particularly in Hawaii. I think Colt Brennan and his group of wide receivers oh, yeah, against Georgia, boy. they're going to they're gonna score. Yeah. The challenge is this, like it is all, every year. Anybody who has to go to the Sugar Bowl to, to deal with New Orleans, to deal with the SEC fan base, let alone when you're coming all the way in from Hawaii, that's a tough thing to deal with. I think Georgia will get physical running the football to try to keep Colt Brennan 
on the sidelines. You have the two backs that are great, Marino and Brown. Run them, eat up the clock, keep Brennan on the sideline. But Hawaii had one of the better rush defenses in the mountain. And, and, in the and, 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 and whack. Whack. San Jose State. And well, it's a different animal. A little different. Sure. Deal, you know, deal. Hawaii Georgia. and June Jones acquitted itself very well against Alabama last year in Tuscaloosa. Now they get a shot at another SEC team. And joining us on the phone, the head coach of Hawaii, June Jones. Uh, June, last night, uh, things got off to a bit of a rocky start against Washington. What was going through your mind when the Huskies jumped on top by three touchdowns? Well, you know, we've been in that situation before. Uh, that's the second time we came back against Michigan State and beat them, and that's kind of what I, what I had in my mind. We started off kind of slow a few years back, and, you know, we uh, we have a team that can score uh, a lot of points in a hurry. Uh, one time we were down... Uh, uh, we were down 28 to, to, to uh, well, we scored 28 points in two minutes and 40 seconds in, in one game. <laughs> so I mean, we, we 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 it's not unusual that 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 would happen. But you know, last night I was a little bit. They were bigger, faster. They were Pac-10 team, and it was the best team to be quite honest that we had played uh, lined up in pregame warm-ups I was looking at them and looking at our guys and I'm going oh my gosh <laughs> you know it's like, it's like guys don't look over there you know they, they were so big so so we but we do have a, a unique group of kids and we play hard and and they love each other and, and 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 as all coaches know when you have those intangible things great things happen what did you sense about the uh, I guess for lack of a better word how tight your guys were knowing what was at stake last night well you know we didn't we didn't protect Colt the first four or five plays so I kind of changed my thought process here I said okay we got to slow their you know rear ends up a little bit so we threw a lot of shuffle passes we did a little more running than we normally do and then once we got them to where we could slow them up a little bit we, we started uh, throwing it and uh, you know we have some talented receivers and I, I, I know one guy on that uh, diocese right there Lee Corso picked Colt Brennan to win the Heisman Trophy before the season and he believed in us the whole time and uh, there's no question in my mind that Cole Brennan is the Heisman Trophy winner, and he was. Coach, uh, this is Lee Corso. Year. Can you just? Uh, I know you coach in the National Football League and some major colleges, etc. What makes Colt Brennan so special? Well, you saw that last drive, uh, you know, and and overcoming all kind of adversity this year. He four times from behind, overtime, through all kinds of things. He's won games, and that's the determining factor. And you just watch any time we had to have a play the last two years, he's made them. And uh, you know, this guy, this kid is is different. He's uh, one of the great ones. He's and he's not a system quarterback like Tim Tebow. Uh, he, this guy is an NFL quarterback and a first-round draft pick, and I think he's the best one in America. Now, when you say a system quarterback like Tim Tebow, what do you mean by that, Jim? Well, I mean that, that you know, Tim Tebow in his system, you know, you guys talk about Colt being a system mm -hmm. quarterback. Colt can run any system. I'm not sure Tim Tebow could run, run our system. Why is that? He's not, a, he's not a natural passer. And what do you look for when you look for a guy that's a natural passer? Accuracy. Accuracy with the football and, and being able to make all the throws. And what in your mind is the detriment? Because doesn't every quarterback have to run a system? What's the detriment to being a system quarterback? Uh, well, the detriment is is that when when average quarterbacks play in in a a a great system, they get better. Okay, but when the great ones play in the great system like ours, like a Jim Kelly or Warren Moon, they're still great and and they get better. And uh, you know. I, 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 you know, we, we, we beat Alabama with a kid named Jason Wielden, uh, who, who, who was backup, was a, was Timmy Chang's backup. And, and we, you know, this, this system is a great system that we have. And when you have a quarterback like Cole Brennan, he breaks how many NCAA records? Uh, I have no idea now. It might be 40 something. He has the all time touchdown record, and it's about 40, I think, yes. Well, when, uh, when you look now, June, at what this is going to do for your program, going to a BCS game, getting over that hump, give me an example of something tangible that it's going to help you with. Well, um, you know, the last couple of years we haven't been able to go to the mainland to recruit. We recruit on the telephone. We recruit with ESPN picking up our games, and we get phone calls. And, um, you know, we have to do it a different way. Uh, and it's a great thrill uh, to be able to play in the history. I've been from Georgia, lived there 20 years coaching and playing, and the Sugar Bowl has always been one of uh, the, the, the things you did on New Year's Day and, and the history and the tradition. And I know how many fans from Georgia 
Georgia and the Southeastern Conference are going to be there. We've been down there before. We went to Alabama last year, and we had the ball in our hands with a chance to beat them at Alabama on the last drive, and we fell up a little bit short. But we, we know what we're in for. We're in over our heads, but our kids will play, and, and, and we'll show up. June, only undefeated team in the country. Congratulations, and best of luck in the Sugar Bowl. All right. Thanks, guys. All right, G Jones, the head coach at Hawaii, joining us now. And perhaps some controversial comments that we will revisit momentarily. Still to come on our bowl selection special, we'll get you a rundown of all of the games coming up. Selection special in the game that will determine the national championship, the All-State BCS National Championship game, January 7th in the Louisiana Superdome. Basically the home team, LSU, number two in the final BCS standings, taking on the Buckeyes as Ohio State makes it for the second straight year. What was it like watching those two games last night and waiting on the results? Well, you know, it's just a reminder. You don't get to watch that much football when you're a coach, believe it or not. Uh, you're so busy. But we've had the last couple weekends where we can watch teams play. And the thing that uh, came into my mind is there's an awful lot of good football teams in this country. And uh, you better be at the top of your game every time you play, most especially uh, in a conference championship game or a rival game or whatever it happens to be. And, uh, you know, nothing surprised me. It wouldn't have surprised me if... The ebb and flow changed nine different times in those games, and it was fun watching our players watch them because they certainly wanted a chance to play in the title game, and, and it was just great entertainment. What do you think it will be like playing LSU in its home state, what some would refer to as a virtual home game for the Tigers? Well, LSU is a good football team. I don't think anyone would question that. I was particularly impressed with the fact that you know they go through that tough SEC schedule, and I don't think anyone can question you know, what rugged road they had to go through. I had that heartbreaking loss against Arkansas. I regrouped, were banged up a little bit, came back in the SEC title game amidst lots of things being talked about in terms of their coaching staff and their future and all those things. And they had the wherewithal. They had the focus, they had the leadership inside the locker room, which is what's most important, to come up and win the SEC. Uh, so we know that it's going to be a battle against a very mature group. Uh, whether it's a home game or whatever, I don't know that that's a big issue. But uh, the fact that we're playing a very, very good, tough, fast, powerful, skilled, excellent SEC football team, uh, you know, we've got our work cut out. The bags almost up there. Talked with Jim Trestle earlier tonight. As you see, Mark sneaking a it's snack. Good. Jack Link's Beef Jerky, our final sponsor. Well, it's a long he show. Chicken, we're eating beef. Uh, how about that? <laughs> he devours them. He doesn't eat them. Back good. almost empty. Hey, well, hey, that's a two-handed eater there. You <laughs> know, one hand. Well, I tell you what, we're going to get our fill uh, leading up to the LSU Ohio State game for the national championship. Lee, as you look at this, I know you got a lot of time to break it down. <clears throat> What's going to be the most important factor in the game? I think the ability for Ohio State to run the ball on the offensive line. I've seen Ohio State play now twice and LSU twice. And I think if Ohio State wins this ball game, and I'll say it again, and Mark, I think, will agree with me, I think you win these kind of games up front. And I tell you one thing, they can run the football. they got the best offensive line in the nation. And what's that defensive end that comes off? Vern Golson. There's a guy named Golson that comes off that corner. I'm telling you, there isn't a guy in the SEC any better than that guy. I like the offensive line and the defensive lines from Buckeyes. You ever heard of Glenn Dorsey? He'll probably be Glenn one of the top three Tyson picks Jackson. in the NFL Wait, is it draft. draft? Tyson. Tyson. Uh, okay, Allie Allie All right, we'll see. I just I, the only thing I can say about this is I think the attitude from Ohio State coming into this game will be interesting because all people remember is last year when they showed up and Florida embarrassed them. But in 2002, they had the mindset that Florida took the field with last year when they were very determined to show that they could play with Miami. My gut tells me they're going to hear a lot of negativity from some people <laughs> in the next month or so that they don't have a chance. Don't ever say and, that I and, threw you under the bus again after and, that one. And, right. and w when they hear that over and over and over, I think they'll approach this game with the mindset that they took the field against Miami in 02, and it'll take that kind of effort and that kind of attitude 
against this LSU team. So do your job. What do you got? Now I've got LSU. those Buckeye tire tracks off no, my what back. You got? What do you got? Well, this is what I got. You know what I got? I've got, this, I've got this team. When you looked at this LSU football team early in the season, everybody thought they were magnificent. When they wanted to get Virginia Tech, they stomped over that football team. That's when they were healthy. They're not healthy right now. You saw that when they played against Mississippi, when they played their last game against Arkansas. They will be healthy. They've got a month to get ready for this game. They will rest up, get ready, get prepared, and when they take the field, that'll be a 100% football team that has better athletes, in my opinion, from top to bottom. And they will spread that Buckeye defense out. Larry Knight, you know I love him as a linebacker. Mm -hmm. They'll spread that Buckeye defense out with their speed. They'll oh, yeah. take advantage of that defense. That's tough. And the other thing you have to think about, Coach, is all that stuff is great, but Bo Pelini's a bit of an X factor here and whether or not he coaches or whether or not he's off to Nebraska. That, that's that, there's two big factors in a game. Number one is Coach Pelini headed to Nebraska and is going to coach the game. And if he isn't, who's going to coach in it? And if he is going to coach in it, what kind of motivational factor is that all going to have? But let me tell you one other thing that's critical. Ohio State's not happy to get in this championship game. They got in it last year. They know they're going there not winning it isn't worth a darn. They will go there with a focus and a purpose like you've never seen. In addition to that, last year, Troy Smith won the Heisman. The Heisman's always distracting, very much so. But I just think that LSU's happy to be there. I think Ohio State will win this football game by two touchdowns. And, hey, I love LSU, love Les Miles, and I'm a Buckeye. But I think Ohio State is just a better team. Can I sign up for that LSU plus 14 someplace? <laughs> <laughs> Not that we would ever tell you what, only for hey, fun. Hey, you only are unbelievable, fun. Mark. Every time I put, you know how I first met Mark, I put my hand in my pocket and I shake hands with him. The guy's always trying to take advantage. I make one. Because you got deep pockets, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but I look, I, you got to look at this matchup, guys, from top to bottom. It's going to be a terrific matchup, and the buildup's going to be phenomenal. And it's going to be, we're going to be talking about it for the next month. But I think there are a lot of X factors in this. You know, you talked about bullpen. If you look at LSU's defense, they've got so many terrific athletes that I don't care who's calling the X's and O's on this defense. Just line them up, let them pin their ears back, and go after this Ohio State offense. And you know, Les Miles, deep down, he wants to beat Ohio State. So he's sure. going to try to find a way to beat Ohio State in this game. It's in his backyard, in the Superdome. LSU will win this game. Who's going to be their quarterback? Is Does it going to be Flynn two? or is it going to be Perry? They got two. Well, you got to prepare for two. That's the good thing about it. And both quarterbacks have started and won. And Lee, you know this. Great football teams know the role they play. I'm the starter. I'm the backup. I cover kickoffs. I do this. Ohio State players know their role. I tell you what, I'm going to say it one more time, and this is for yours. Games like this are one up front. Well, offensive and defensive lines. And I tell you, I've seen them both. And I know Dorsey, but he's got one leg. And I've seen that guy, what's his name again? Tyson Goldstein. Jackson. I saw him come around the... No, no. no. Vernon Goldstein. Vernon, Vernon Goldstein. Come around that... Supposed to be a good Michigan tackle. Like, whoosh. And I'm telling you, that offensive line from Ohio State's not only big, they're strong. They're mean. I mean, I tell you, I love that offensive line, and I think that's going to be the difference in keeping them in this football game. I, I'm, going to get, I'm going to give you this about yeah. Vernon Golston for sure. I believe that he got a letter from Michigan. He lettered because he spent so much time in the Michigan Thank backfield you. there. He, he lettered as yeah. a running and back. That, and the, the tackle, he, the the tackle right he was beaten was one of those guys who was supposed, supposed to be, to be like top, top, ten, pick. top yeah. ten pick, Take right? Long. The big tackle like Take the... Yeah, Thank you. That's right. Right around them. Why well, I like that kid. LSU and Ohio State on January 7th for the national championship. Jim Tressel has won five national titles when you include those that he's won at Youngstown State. Les Miles, fairly new to this level, just won his first SEC championship game. The LSU Tigers did win 2003 BCS title in New Orleans, and we've been catching up with coaches all night. Earlier, we asked Les Miles just what it was like watching this game or watching the games last night to see if he was in. What was it like watching those games last night and hoping that you get an opportunity? 